Gustafsson stood before his posse and nuke, covered in a whitish goop, his open mouth dribbling with watery chunks of sediment. It is time to squeeze, he announced. Oh dear. The other hivers gave a bleating cheer, and Nuke noticed that everyone else was keeping a very safe distance. Luckily for him, the hiver prince had something entirely dull in mind. We must compress the medium to make it strong, he explained, making a rapid pounding motion with his hand. Cease your work and aid us! The queen watches expectantly. This meant that he wanted the guild to help him build a machine that would congeal the pale mank sprayed out by the mining drills. Why? You've already asked more questions than Gustafsson allowed. Throughout the day, the guild actually came up with something that pleased the prince. It was a huge mess of presses, clamps, hot plates and pipes and altogether turned runny ground sludge into a more seductively oozy, grainy putty. As it was squeezed out of the end of the machine, the hivers gathered around to squidge it in their hands, and then, with no further discussion, let it fall into their open mouths. We are impregnated to birth the new hive, Gustafsson explained. Is there a better way of putting that? Nuke asked. Silence! We begin to gurgitate. Prepare the site. Nuke retreated to Izumi's office. She was positively delighted to hear of what was going on outside. They're going to make a hive. No one's ever seen this happen, she reported. And live to tell the tale, Nuke called after her. But there was no dampening Izumi's spirits on this one, for some reason. She directed the guild workers to clear a space further down the canyon amid a sheltered grove of half-dead trees. Then, pacing towards them in lockstep, the hamster-cheeked hivers approached, dripping with filth and looking very pleased with themselves. Far away from this debacle, Wadston was in Enrico's quote-unquote office at the tech scribe enclave. The brainy bot sat with several unopened bottles of rum in front of him, and was in the process of ordering another. Good for the economy, don't you know? He remarked when his collection was expanded. Speaking of which, do you have the tribute? The payment, Watson said. Ah, you wish to preserve your dignity. And yet here you are purchasing 50 copies of this ancient human erotica, thinly veiled as some kind of artistic literature. Hey, Enrico, stop being such a backer. Nuke's voice said from Wadston's hip. Wadston had one of the quantum entangled AI cores on him, now linked to a partner in the base for instantaneous communication of insults, snapbacks and putdowns. This is all reference material for our major historical work, all right? Skeletons are naked all the time, so no double standards. Bah! It's not like V would go to a hot spring just to employ an elaborate method to spy on... Wait a minute. Drat! Why am I only programmed to tell the truth? Fine, just go, you disgusting creatures, and don't come back until you have something worth looking at for me. No sundry bullshit, okay? Sorry, man, but history is full of sundry bullshit. What's then, my man? You better get back here fast. The hivers are vomiting everywhere and then rolling about in it. It must be mixed! Gustafsson's voice faintly chimed. Obviously, Wadston couldn't wait to get home now. In the canyon, the Hivers had successfully created an enormous pile of… something, and Azumi excitedly told the rest of the guild that it was time to watch the Hivers sculpt it into a brand new hive. But there was a catch. You all must build! You will be our hive drones, Gustafsson said. I think we're cool just watching. Do your thing and… I guess we'll be better for having seen it," Nuke said. Impossible! It takes an entire generation of drones to properly shape the gut essence. We cannot do it alone. Help! With your hands! Know the feeling! Els jumped into the big pile of goop and happily reported that it was nice and warm. The others weren't so happy to hear it. However, they did eventually step forward and dare prod the blob. 
The Hivers began laying out the foundations, and the others were directed to pile up the manufactured mank into walls. Bits of old tree and stretches of metal rebar were roughly arranged into a frame, and up said frame did the horrid, almost living mush pile. Working into the night, the familiar teardrop form of a Hiver hut began to materialize. While the horrible other flesh creatures went to sterilize themselves back over by the wells, the Hivers sat in their dingy lair and admired their handiwork. It was the finest regurgitated structure the world had seen in a long time, some say. My queen, your hive is complete, Gustafsson reported to Beep. Beep, it has a nice smell, she said. The smell will intensify. The smell represents the coming of a new age. Here you will become Hive. We are one step closer. Funnily enough, everyone else was happy to take many steps further away from the reeking construct, and thus the Hivers finally had a place they could call their own. How nice. Azumi was very pleased to have witnessed that historic moment, but was also amused to see just how effective her automatic revolving harpoon launchers were. Some 50 Reavers had tried to break into the magical land of Mank, but within a few minutes found themselves riddled with meter-long spikes darting down from the walls. In fact, they were so effective that several harpoons went through the Reavers, through the gate in front of them, and into the workers holding the gate closed from the other side. Suffice to say, it did more damage to the guys it soared through than those it eventually ended up stuck into, but this didn't really improve the workplace safety record. Cleaning that up incurred a delay to the guild's next outing, which proved to be long enough for the Hivers to really settle in. When Nuke next called everyone together to move out, they were nowhere to be seen. Nuke hiked on over to the hut and found Beep sitting on a cushion between a couple of smoky fire torches flanked by the other Hivers. You approach the Queen! State your purpose! Gustafsson barked. I thought she wasn't the Queen yet, Nuke said. I'm practicing! Beep! Beep informed him. Practice makes perfect, Nuke shrugged. She is perfect already! Gustafsson was quick to insist. Nuke agreed, and with sufficient deference and groveling, was able to convince the Hivers to come along for the next mission. Back in the base, Izumi was spotted storming out of her office. Why don't you just go and interface with your precious Eo and leave me alone? She shouted through the door before slamming it closed. Lovers Tiff? Nuke asked. It's that core. It keeps asking for more and more. All these experiments, all this stuff. We're not like the university, I keep telling him, but he just starts singing my praises and saying how amazing I am. What a bastard. He's manipulating me, Nuke. Aren't you bothered? <laughs> like you'd seriously get seduced by a machine. Oh, yeah, sure. Anyway, we can be like the university. We can be better than that university. I'll have a few words with our new spider workers. If they can build the second empire, you know, they might be able to help us out. Nuke had a word with the spider bots, in a very figurative sense, and put together a little scheme with some help from the tech hunters. Leaving everyone to carry it out, he then took the guild back to Trader's Edge for a happy-ish reunion with the skimmers. To their dismay, ish, many of the beasts were skin and bones, even more so than usual. Sorry, my prince, but they wouldn't eat anything we gave them, a samurai told Nuke. What did you try? We gave them rice weed, green fruit, meat cubes, bloody banquet it was. No choco bread. Choco bread? They're addicted to choco bread. I sold you all that choco bread, remember? Oh, the brown lump stuff. I thought that was called TCMNPHGINTCC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fucking brown bread. And without it, the skimmers are dead. Put that in the samurai code and stuff, all right? Yes, my prince. And from now on, you will address them by the title of Skim Friend. Yes, my prince. Soon, the skimmers were revitalized, and hence the guild were devitalized by having to carry them onwards to the Holy Nation. The border fort of Ocran's shield was now garrisoned by the Hundred Guardians, who cheered for their order of magnitude superiors as the guild arrived. Desire Battleborn, will you be heading to Blister Hill? One asked. Indeed. 
The Holy Phoenix awaits, and the Scroops need a runabout, Isaiah said. Scroops? Ah, you'll see. Why don't you come along? It would be an honor, Invincible. The more the merrier. This battle will decide the fate of the Holy Nation. Shame to miss it, eh? Indeed, and so a great many Shek troops joined the guild as they carried on west. They crossed the lavish valley of Okran's pride, vibrant with its yellowish life, and began ascending a shallow hill towards some mountains. Near the top lay this blister hill, the seat of power of the Holy Nation. All right, here's the plan, Izumi said, clutching a coarse, coverless book in her hands. We wait until it's dark, then we sneak over to the wall and start flinging the Holy Liar into the city. It's got everything the people need to know. They'll never trust the Phoenix after this, especially if this truth just so happens to fall from the sky. Oh, I'll do my Akran impression again. Order everyone to read it, Rick said. Uh, maybe. Let's think about that a little. Uh, anyway, uh, once we're out of the truth grenades, we pull back and wait. It's going to take a while for all this to sink in. Could be hours, could be weeks. But when the people are ready, they'll rise up and destroy the Nash from within. A fine plan. By the way, where did all those hundreds go? Isaiah asked. Looking around, the two companies of Shek they had picked up were nowhere to be seen. All but one. There was a Shek standing on top of the gate to Blister Hill, holding a Nash guard's head up and roaring loudly. Or we could just run in there and kill them all now, Izumi conceded. Let's run in there and kill them all now, Isaiah nodded. Thus, the Battle of Blister Hill just sort of started to no particular fanfare, although perhaps that was the best part, as the city gate had been left wide open. It was swiftly captured, but in an open market square just beyond it, the Holy Nation troops were massing. Arise! Arise! Groups of the Empire! Nuke called as elves roused the ranks. Fields shall be taken, classics shall be printed, a tooth day, a brown day, ere the earth rises! Skim now, skim now, skim, skim them to ruins, but leave world's end, all right? Bread! 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 Tenoheka, Banzai! With this, a magnificent charge of furious skimmers fell upon the city like... like a bunch of weird giant maggots with creepy legs scattering over a dirty pile of crumbling junk. My prince, that was a marvelous, sophisticated speech, Watchton said. I know, thought of it all by myself. Now we should probably go kill some hogs too. Be careful, Nuke. The phoenix is in there, Azumi warned. Who knows what he's got planned? Indeed, within the city there was another ring of fortifications surrounding the Holy Phoenix's central compound. There the best and brawniest of the Holy Nation stood guard over their supreme leader, awaiting the command to wipe out the pitiful attackers. An attack? Bah! Those fools! They think they can catch me! They'll never reach me! In the sky! The phoenix cackled, running to the roof of his palace and flapping his arms wildly. I will smite them from Okrin's side! Yes! Square! The holy soldiers dared not even think that anything was amiss. Thus, the gate to the compound was not even closed as the invaders fought their way closer. Through this open gate, a guild member was unceremoniously dragged. A Nash troop had disarmed one of Gustafsson's followers and dragged him into the central jail. Seeing this, Elena grasped her blade. I'm no less of a Sheik than the rest of them, she said to herself, running into the jail. There she expected to fight her way through hordes of guards and rescue the Hiver, but she found the place bathed in calming music from speakers all around. She walked over to the prisoner cage where the Hiver, Silvershade, was being held. The Nash troop that captured him was leaning against the side of it. So anyway, I started thinking, if we can't be with the She-Devils, can't we be, you know, close and stuff to other things? He said. You speak of free association. This is a path to many abilities some consider to be 
unnatural. Silver Shade nodded. Sounds great. Can I associate with you, mate? Hm. Remove your clothes, and we shall perform the test. While the guard was stuck with his shirt over his head, Elena opened the cage and carried Silvershade away. Regret. However, you can always associate with yourself, Silvershade called as he was whisked away. It wasn't the heroic rescue Elena had imagined, and maybe it was hardly a rescue at all, but it was probably all for the best. As Elena left the jail, Gustafsson was leading the rest of the Hivers up the stairs. I smelled imminent association, he said. Silvershade gave a disappointed hum, and the others patted him in what was probably sympathy. Not really for us disassociated ones to understand. They went in anyway, and soon the jailhouse could perhaps be said to be under friendly control. Meanwhile, the fighting out in the city market was over, and the result was a clear victory for the Skim Friends. They now filed in through the nice wide gate into the Phoenix's compound, where the real fighting got started. The Inquisition and High Paladins fought valiantly to prevent the assortment of beasts and beast-tier humanoids from reaching their leader, holding their own for several hours. The whole time, both they and the guild were searching for the Holy Phoenix, but in the chaos, his whereabouts remained unknown. Outside the palace, the skimmers sniffed about, but suddenly they were slammed by bolts coming from the roof of a nearby barrack. Prince Tashino, we must silence that rooftop, Isaiah called out. Nuke nodded and followed him up the barrack stairs. They quickly accosted the crossbowmen, who were no match for the experienced swordsmen. Where's the bird dude, Hog? Nuke demanded of a fallen warrior. You'll never take him alive. He lives on inside us. Yeah, guessing that's where he usually is. What's wrong with girls anyway? Especially with like cat ears and love heart eyes and all this gas. Uh, what was I saying? My prince! Watson's voice shouted from the street below. Looking out, Nuke saw a man in gleaming white armor standing on a ledge jutting out from the palace. You insolent fools! He screeched. His arms began to wave violently. I will cast this whole planet away and return to Ocran, for you truly deserve only to be discarded like we did to the traitor machines. Actually, man, they only betrayed us after we did that. You know, after we betrayed them, Nuke shouted. I mean, it's all explained in this series of light novels. It's like the Holy Fire, but with more cleavage. It's unputdownable, and not just because the pages are sticky. Silence, mortal! I fly now! He flies now? Desire asked. He flies now, Nuke nodded, seeing the phoenix leap from the ledge, his arms sweeping at the air. Due to certain matters of physics, this caused almost no change in his momentum, whereas the pull of gravity did. That is to say, he didn't fly away at all. He fell, bounced off a pudgy skimmer waiting below, and rolled out into the street. Scroops and guild members alike closed in on him, but without delay he took up a greatsword from the ground and kept all at bay with his wild attacks, not to mention his wild cawing and squeaking. His strength seemed superhuman. With the flat of his sword he batted skimmers away like they were flies, and when the sharp edge struck the armor on the Thousand Guardians, it cut through like teeth through a mule cuboid. Opponent after opponent fell, and still the screeching went on. I won't stay here and die like all of you, he growled. I know what the machines are planning. They will destroy you all, and I will live on forever at Ocran's side. Actually, Ocran is a corruption of the term Bogran, a First Empire colloquialism for Earth clanners, or Earth Channers as it was written in that era. It is derived from the same root as the Naish term Bogan, Zumi carefully explained. You think I don't know that, you childish humans! This was all for your own good, and yet you ruin it like you ruin everything. You deserve to bring about your own demise after all. 
Look, wingnut, we foiled your shitty scheme to save everyone by making everything absolutely shit all the time. So just shut up and read my light novel, Nuke said. Fools! I can't read! That's how the machines get you! But it's mostly pictures, Nuke protested, to no avail. Instead, he moved up and did his best to turn the phoenix's sword aside. After several bouts, he got nothing. It was time for more devious measures. My man, the secret strategy, Nuke called to Wadston. Wadston, who truly would do anything for the Tashino clan, it turned out, ripped off his tunic and bared what there was of his chest to the phoenix. Oh, Grace, Grace, it is too beautiful. How can the femoids compete? The phoenix exclaimed, before suddenly eating dirt, courtesy of Nuke's heel on the back of his head. Cleavage conquers all, no matter what, Nuke nodded sagely. Though still well enough to move helped him tie the unconscious phoenix up. Alas, the open sky was always so close yet so far. With the big bird clipped, the city was almost taken. But by this point, the guild were mostly lying around on the floor trying not to die, as were the skimmers. The mobile members tended to wounds and hit the jailhouse once again, as it turned out some more prisoners had been taken. Crazy human! Flipping between saying I must be destroyed and asking me on a date, Neil said from within his cage. Guess at some point they took the logical from biological. <laughs> Sounds like they missing a real good date, Rick commented. The prisoner cages were all opened up, but the guild were still imprisoned in the holy compound on account of how many of them were unconscious. A couple of Hivers and Shek were missing limbs as well, which certainly didn't help move things along. Many hours were spent gradually bringing everyone around and attending to injuries. However, those hours were not entirely quiet. More holy sentinels appeared from the nooks and crannies of the city, and small groups trickled in from the roads outside. Exhausted fighting carried on through the small hours of the night. In the morning, the guild began to regroup around the big burning pan of oil outside the palace. It was the holy fire, one supposes, but handily it also possessed properties remarkably like an ordinary fire, and hence was a nice spot to pitch up and make breakfast. Yet bitter news would spoil the taste. Wadston returned from the jailhouse, reporting a death. In the doorway, another of Gustafsson's gang, Pato, lay with a dagger in his chest. A Holy Nation soldier was crumpled up beside him, equally dead. The other Hivers came over and knelt around their fallen comrade. The first of the great builders is no more. Who will be next? Gustafsson asked. While seemingly tactless, the other Hivers seemed to take solace in the question. They loaded his body up on the Garu for transit home. But that transit was still a ways off, with the guild far too battered to consider reforming the great travelling homunculus. They spent the next day chilling, with the odd bit of killing, enjoying the rough luxury of the holy compound. They gently placed their truth grenades all around town, and they were quickly lapped up by hiding residents. By nightfall, they finally managed to haul themselves and their stuff out into the city, finally hobbling and dragging their way to the city limits by midnight. All but one of them, that is. Ignacio is missing, Gustafsson said. You sure, man? I mean, it's kind of dark. Isn't that him? Nuke said, pointing at one of the other Ignacio-ish hivers standing around. That is Ren, my bodyguard. I talk of Ignacio, my bodyguard. Yeah, yeah, I know. All right, man, just for you, let's get a team and go look for him. I know where he is. Beep. Beep chimed in. That saves time. Good old magic. Nuke nodded. He is trapped. He is locked in a box. A big box. Oh no! Ah, uh, maybe magic won't be enough then. Yes it will. Beep! I will get him! Yes, my queen. It is time to begin testing your power. We all felt it there. You can use it, Gustafsson said. Care to explain, Bad Green? Nuke asked. But no, Gustafsson did not care. What actually happened to Ignacio? He had been locked in a strong room inside the east tower of the inner gate, now a few meters of steel and stone away from freedom. There was no lock to pick, 
and no guards to associate into submission. It would take an intervention from a god to get him out of there anytime soon, but fortunately he had something even better coming. Beep! Beep commanded, standing before the gates with her arms raised. Nothing happened. Beep! Beep! She repeated. For some reason this was not achieving much. A few townsfolk and guards approached, ready to grab the frail hiver. Beep! 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 She shouted, and suddenly there was a great rumbling from underfoot. A loud, metallic moan echoed from below. Then the entire gatehouse reared and sunk downwards a little before bending over forwards. The heavy gate was ripped from its place by its own weight, tearing off the sides of the gatehouse towers as it boomed to the ground. Ignacio leapt down through the new opening. The great mover obeys! You really are the queen, he said. Beep! Let's run away! Beep! Beep said. It was a good plan. They raced out of the city and rejoined the guild, after which the whole group retreated back to the safety of Ocran's shield. What was that terrible noise, Queen Beep? Watson asked. The Great Mover is still awake, Beep. It can still shape the world, Beep explained. I am afraid I've not heard of this Great Mover. It is from the beginning, Beep. It sleeps forever, but it cannot die, Beep. I see. Izzy, are the Hivers actually magic? Nuke asked. Seems that way. Great Mover, huh? If we get that data from the other queen, I guess we'll know for sure, Izumi said. Right, right, looking forward to it, probably. In the meantime, I think my dad might be interested in this naughty little sparrow. I am a phoenix, and I will not be caged, the phoenix said. Then his mouth kept moving, but no sound came out. Yeah, it works. Muted, Rick nodded. New man, you're magic too. Am I the only one who isn't magic, Nuke said. Ain't magic is science, baby. Just turned his volume down. Oh wait, you didn't realize? He's a new man too. The first and last, from the bad old days. How'd you think he's so powerful? No fleshy can throw a skimmer off him like that. You big brain sisters should have realized. The Holy Phoenix is a bona fide android. What a bombshell, though it didn't change the guild's plans. They would have plenty of time to discuss this development in the safety of the capital, to which they would return in victory. The holy nation was over. A new age would begin. Radioactive weed was just the start of what the unified power of all the people of the world could unleash. Hang on, hang on, something's wrong, Nuke said. Ahead, the walls of Heft were lined only with the usual samurai guards. My man, I thought you told everyone what's happening. I did, my prince, Wadston said. I informed them that the victory procession was their best chance to see the new heroes of the Empire. And of course, the wonderful tamed skimmers. You told them about the Scroops? Of course. You dreg, people are racist against Scroops. Ah, uh, I can't imagine why, my prince. Don't matter, we can do this the United City's way. Captain! Nuke waved over the samurai at the gate, and quickly ordered them to force out an adoring crowd to welcome the guild home. Townsfolk were lined up alongside the road, their eyes locked on the gently writhing ball of monsters that overshadowed the rest of the procession. Wadston went up and down the lines handing out bribes, and soon enough everyone was willing to turn their attention to the proud ball draggers instead. To kick things off, Nuke held up the Holy Phoenix, who cawed and struggled against his binds. The Holy Phoenix has been defeated! The war is over! Nuke declared. This brought about a wave of cheap, nay, free adulation. The people realized that this wasn't the weird farce they had quite rightly presumed it would be. This was a historic moment for Dreg and Noble alike. At last, the party atmosphere began to set in. The guild walked through the crowds to cheers and applause, rising to a crescendo every time Wadston showered loose cats from an upturned Holy Nation helmet. The Hivers held Beep up above them and chanted, Associate, it is your fate! Plenty of Ronin Hivers were spotted bowing among the audience. Another royal woman was getting some attention too. 
Princess! Princess! A girl called out to Azumi from amid a bunch of gawking adolescents. I'm not really. Well, hello there, thank you, yes. Izumi bumbled. I can't believe we got to see you. You're so cool. Is that... I don't... Uh, thanks, guys. Look, I did my hair like you. Do you like it? The girl said, showing off her greasy, disheveled-looking ponytail. It was an exact match. Thought she'd be taller. One of the other girls shrugged. Oh, fuck off! Izumi immediately snapped back. She was about to apologize, but the rest of the group cheered her on. She's so sophisticated, I told you, the leading girl insisted. Izumi made her escape as the group began telling each other to fuck off with ever-increasing fervor. The procession soon reached the Imperial Palace, where they marched up the winding ramp, homunculus and all, into the halls of Tengu Tashino I. The throne he once sat upon was now just a supporting column for a series of hashish burrows, with the Emperor himself nowhere to be seen. Uh, Dad, we got you a present, Nuke called into the warren. How high will it get me? An echoing voice replied. High as a phoenix, it's that business we discussed, the war. Oh, still going on is that? Not anymore. Just come out of your hole, Dad. You're embarrassing us in front of the bird freak. Ha! <laughs> so this is how you fallen creatures live, the phoenix said. You can still be saved. Read the truth in the holy fire. Read? You fool, I can't read, Tengu said as he emerged, covered in a hairy moss that was flourishing in the dank warren. That's how the weebs get ya. Oh, so you understand that at least. Yeah, yeah, it's important. My boy is a fucking goner with all that. I got me goggles here modified so that I can't even see any of that shit anymore. Hardly working actually though. I can see your bloody ball of cat girls over there just fine. Actually dad, those are skimmers. Fuck! The parasites got me! Oh, I'll be banned. It's the end for me. Send for the doctor. Dad, you've just got moss growing on your brain. You'll need a dose of glow green, right Izzy? Uh, no, Izumi said. Oh, don't make me beg. Phoenix man, you stupid piece of shit. Let's go downstairs and get blazed, Tengu said. Blazed? Like a blazing phoenix? The phoenix asked. You'll be burned out and sore in eye. The dream, eh? Yes, yes, the dream. So even the phoenix had fun at the big victory party that evening. The scroops were returned to their stables, where a few local people even dared to go and feed them lumps of choco bread. In the palace, the city nobles were all squashed into the dining hall alongside the guild. All right, you freaks, let's get the introductions out of the way, Tengu said from the head of a long table. What have we got? We got this old chap here. He's the only phoenix. He's that guy we ate, but don't let him get you down. He's been fucked to earth and back by our guests here. Over there, we got two weird pale looking Sheik. See him? The one without boobs is the Prince of the Sheik Kingdom, apparently. So be nice to him, or we'll have even more bullshit to deal with, alright? Then here's this group of pot plants over here. Uh, they got a couple of celebs. Let me get this right. It's Gustavo, Prince of the Mankive, and Queen Boop. Beep! Beep corrected him. Yeah, they got their own thing going on, don't worry about them. So our next special guest is this guy who sounds like a skeleton, but looks like a bloke. He's a big shot in skeleton land or something, right? Allow me, your majesty, Rick said, standing up. General Redlin Ricard of the Biobash Order, dishonorably discharged, and now the famous Big Stick Rick. Demonstrations free, all night service at a negotiable rate. Right, right, guest of dishonor then, nice one, Tengu nodded. And of course, my only child, Prince of the Empire, uh... Nuke, Nuke prompted. Nuke Teshino, he sorted us out with all this war shit, so let's have a toast and eat some of his weird choco bread sandwich heresy his lot keep going on about. Long live the Empire or something. A toast was given. Toast was eaten, and all had a mildly pleasant time befitting of an upstanding dinner party. So you see, I think peace is the only option now, as I was saying to his table fellows. With the Scroops stationed here in Heft, 
who would dare wage war on the United Cities? And yet, should the United Cities wish to wage war on the Kingdom, they'd find that getting those fussy buggers to walk ten paces down the street is a task so Herculean that it simply isn't worth the bother. In this way, those silly scroops are the linchpin of global geopolitics. Everyone nodded, and the Empire nobles were impressed that this strange-looking Sheik had such a head on his shoulders, although only because they had foolishly presumed otherwise. Nuke was also discussing lofty political matters. You don't need the slaves anymore, Dad. Being a slave fucking sucks, and having to deal with having slaves around also fucking sucks. Boy, you don't get it. Who do you think gets all the stuff done around here? All this food is from the hands of those slaves! Get rid of them, you get rid of everything else too!" Tengu argued. Manx Ant Canyon has more food than we can eat a hundred times over, and I ain't got a single slave. Everyone's free to leave whenever, but they just don't. Is it because they're addicted to the drugs we give them? Probably, but that's better than just threatening to kill them and shit. In addition, your majesty, there is the matter of a technical solution, Izumi chimed in. We now know that in the First Empire, they used machines to perform labor. They made a few mistakes along the way, and destroyed the whole world, but let's not write it off. We've got plenty of prototypes at Manx Ant to show you. Ah, but your little den's in the sticks. No, it's on the other bloody side of the sticks. Can't you just move back in here? I'll make you both a space in the nest, Tengu said. You need to see it, man. We'll make it easier, somehow. Nuke nodded, drawing a less sure nod from Izumi. Anyway, let's just say, put it out there that we might be doing something a lot better than slavery real soon, but it's gonna be real similar still. It's like we're going to enslave the machines instead. Ah, that classic opening line. Always works out great, Rick said, immediately swiveling around to join the discussion, breaking the waist of his new man suit in the process. I hope y'all are gonna be studying the perverted history kid thing if you're gonna be talking like that. Oh yeah, Dad, we made this book that explains the historical treatment of skeletons that destroyed the First Empire, told through the medium of a coming-of-age reverse harem gas girl manga with revolutionary attention to detail, Nuke explained. Not wrong, Rick nodded. Those manga girls ain't even ever seen a shower, yet they drew it just right. Even politics comes in little comics now. I'm too old for this shit. All right, I'll be open-minded. And by that I mean fucking stoned. Oi, everyone, turn the lights out. I want to show you something. Another classic opening line. He referred to Nuke's custom warm, glowing green supply, which bathed the room in an eerie hue. The high and mighty nobles were disgusted by the notion of taking poor people drugs until they tried it. Oh, the party truly began at that moment, and Big Stick Rick did very good business. As with any good party, the less said about it all, the better. In the morning, the guild set off for Manx Sand. As the Emperor had complained, it really was a bit of a slog, and while lamenting this very matter, the guild were confronted with the other issue previously discussed. There he is! A voice shouted. A band of manhunters appeared from behind a sandbank. That's the prince trying to free the slaves and destroy this empire! Give him a taste of what he's missing, huh? Can't remember if Dad said it was okay for me to kill all of you, Nuke said. Better to ask forgiveness than permission. Kill them! Isaiah shouted. The manhunters realized they were in trouble as soon as the first blows were struck, but they were out of their misery by the second. And you know, I don't even need to ask for forgiveness, because I'm not sorry, Izumi shrugged. The sentiment was universal. Nuke led the guild south, and then up a small hill that overlooked the eastern sea. This isn't the way, my prince, Wadston pointed out. But it could be. Storm Gap Beach is right over there, you can see it on the horizon, Nuke said, pointing out in the more literal sense. Indeed, across the blue salt beds of gut, the brown waters of the long Storm Gap estuary, and past the line of greyish cliffs marking the horizon, faint specks of smoke rising from Manx Ann's bakery were being carried off by the winds. I fear the swim and the beak things will render this route rather perilous, Wadston said. 
We need to build a massive thing with footplates where you walk that goes right above the whole area. A bridge? Azumi suggested. A skyway, Nuke called. The guild sat on that sandy hillside, enjoying a rainy picnic, while Nuke and the tech hunters debated various minutiae of civil engineering. The end result of all this, little more than wet behinds and a sky-high dream, but the matter would be returned to in earnest soon enough. In the meantime, they all carried on back to the long way home. On the way, they passed a farming camp, run with the decreasingly legal economic model of slave labour. Nuke decided to pop in to deliver the news. Outside the gates, a gang of manhunters were preparing a slave trading caravan. They were very angry to see the guild emerge from the hills. Indeed, it was the rumours of some absolute buffoons arguing about whether bridge columns benefited from the power of teamwork that got them out of bed in the first place. They didn't hesitate to draw their weapons, but they really should have. Look, I am killing them! Beep! Beep boasted. She pulled back the arms of her crossbow and pressed the trigger again. There was no bolt loaded, and yet the slaver she targeted reeled over backwards. Incredible, my queen! Every being you kill makes those still alive more grateful for your association! Please continue! Gustafsson said. He hurriedly reloaded his own crossbow, held stealthily at his hip, just in time to pull his trigger again when Beep did. Ah, and they said Hivers had no notion of romance. They were probably going to keep saying that, actually. At about two in the morning, the guild sauntered into the middle of the slave camp. It featured a large cultivated patch of mank, ringed by jails, barracks and a thick wall. Given the time of day, all was quiet. Nuke quickly saw to that. This is a public service announcement. It is the case that this facility has been officially sanctioned by order of the... No more fucking bullshit, please. Thanks, Bill. Of... Of... What year is it? No one knows. Starts with a seven, maybe? Izumi shrugged. Of the year seven... Four... Probably a one in there. All right, zeros. How many zeros? Uh... What if there are zero zeros? Shit. Okay, let's just say year seven for now, pending further amendments. Oi! Shut the fuck up! A voice shouted from a nearby barracks. Omiwa mo chindaru, Becca! Nuke called back. What? The voice echoed. I'll handle this, Isaiah said, funneling his hands over his mouth. Prison break! He boomed. That got things started. The guild burst into the slave quarters and slammed the guards to the ground. Locks were smashed, and the freed slaves boosted the gear of their fallen captors. This prison break is brought to you by the TCM Plus to the Power of Plus Guild, Nuke tried to announce over the noise. Oh, but it's also brought to you by the Empire. Slavery is over. Live free, die of an overdose. This is our creed. This stalwart rallying cry took the mob from jail to jail, busting slaves out and throwing slavers in. Guards occasionally appeared to intervene, but that never lasted long. The thousand guardians secured both gates for the sake of any who wished to depart. And of course, Nuke was always recruiting new muscle for his walled-off mank farm, yet most of the liberatees decided to stay. Your Majesty, if you ain't forgotten us, then we gotta do our part one of them explained to Nuke. From now on, our hoes will work for you. Pimpin, Rick remarked. It was classic comedy, and also probably a good idea, as until the guild set up their machines, someone actually did need to keep the food supply coming. And it's all good business. Instead of selling produce to pay the guards, the farm could just scrap the guards and pay the willing workers instead. Everyone wins. Except the out-of-work guards, I suppose. But manhunters becoming job hunters aside, all was well in that remote farming outpost by the time the guild marched off the next evening. They marched past the Fallen Eye, skirted the fringes of Venge, crossed the rocky bluffs north of Brink, and at last sighted the giant ancient chimney in the middle of Black Scratch. Manxand was close, and hence Nuke had to halt the guild for a special matter. Izzy, I need you to wear this blindfold, Nuke said. 
Can we just get back before you horrible biologicals get started with your parasite shit? Rick asked. Apparently not. It'll spoil the surprise if she sees it, Nuke smiled. It's barely degenerate at all, this is wholesome fun. Yeah, I've heard that one before. Fine, Nuke, I'll do it, let's just move, a worn out Azumi conceded. The rest were free to observe Nuke's surprise as they got home. That's... how did you do this? Elena asked. Incredible! How did you achieve such great size? Watchton asked. <laughs> Showing off, all it is, Sandor commented. Izumi was certainly interested, but wasn't entirely sure why everyone else had to be involved with this. Turned out it was a gift for everyone, really, but Izumi was to be the main recipient. I should mention, by the way, that I'm talking about an enormous, looming, towering, rock-solid Second Empire-style citadel. Fashioned after World's End University, this hundred-meter-tall monster rose above the top of the canyon, its chrome-dome roof gleaming in the morning light. When Izumi's blindfold was removed, she was standing in the circular main hall of the building. Welcome to your new palace, Princess, Nuke said with a grin. Oh, not you as well. I mean, sorry, thanks, this is incredible, it's so big! Ah, how I've longed to hear it, Hammer's voice said. From upstairs, a robot spider covered in grey dust plodded down into the hall. Yeah, I mean, it's because of the bots. Even a billion slaves couldn't do this, but a few machines and bang, Nuke said. Bang indeed, kind prince, Hammer said. We've been working day and night, welding. Soaring, mixing, comment, as you insist on calling it. I should warn you that it's not all set, and this whole thing is liable to collapse at any moment, to be honest. But hark, is that not the world in a nutshell? To die in this dusty prison would be pure poetry. Hammings, you're killing the vibe. Ah, and I suppose you think you're a better vibrator than me. Nonsense. Eh, princess? Hammer was shooed away, and the biologicals took a look upstairs. The second level had a large lab space for anything Izumi might desire, for scientific research purposes, of course, and upstairs was the master bedroom, where I suppose other purposes could be attended to. As of now, this new build was devoid of character, color, and indeed furniture, but for the first time, Princess Izumi started to feel worthy of this spurious title. This is unbelievable. We can create uranium atomic splitting devices with all this space, Izumi said. Yeah, and I can get a shelf, Nuke said. It's wonderful, Nuke. Just what I wanted. Great. You did drop a few hints, after all. Like, when you said exactly what you wanted. Thanks for picking up on that. Thanks so much. I can never repay you. And I can never charge you, so let's call it even, eh? Oh, speaking of charge... I grabbed a couple of batteries from Dad's basement. Yep, you really do know what I want, Izumi almost purred. This is another of those things where the less said about it the better, so let's just leave this on the note that both were very happy with their new property. Who actually was paying for all this? Let's just say that the guild now owed several million cats when you added up all the debts incurred in materials and labor, but they could surely repay that with their invaluable services to world civilization. Yes, now that the war was over, it was time for some true R&R, reading and research. Azumi's tech hunters were to begin work on strange devices that made use of the warming rock fragments, and Nuke's Mangaka Girls, i.e. the same people, started work on the sequel to Gas Girl and the Four Ethical Princes, Bacteria Boy and the Four Hygienic Matrons. It was the cleanest filth known to history, a period which spanned back at least seven years, rumour had it. Best leave them all to it, and wait for the next great outing. This was brewing with increasing volume over in the Mank Hive down the canyon. The strange hums and chants of the hivers within, loudening by the day, would eventually become a fresh call to weird adventure. According to this, we really should have been wearing gloves to handle that uranium, Izumi reported. She was sat on her new premium-grade high-yield scientific discovery surface, also known as a desk, with a couple of printouts on her lap. 
Nuke dropped an armful of uranium onto said desk, dusting a yellowish residue off his hands. A warming rock a day keeps the brain moss away, he sagely quipped. It seemed the opposite was written on Azumi's report, but how could she refute the famous professor of superluminal millipedes and sundera studies? Hammer says there is a way to make these warming rocks really warm, like melting stuff warm, Izumi said. If we can work out how to do it and control it, we could boil off a load of water and have all the steam we need. Yeah, been lacking steam, if anything, Nuke nodded. You'll see, trust me. With pleasure. Maybe we could boil away the estuary and get this bridge going. Nuke, seriously, there is absolutely no point in trying to make a bridge out there. The design alone would take years, even for a core. And I'm not interested in your material bridges, the desk said in Hammer's voice. No, only the transition of love from digital to analog forms gets my juices flowing. Perhaps a few hormones in my wires and a little charge across the surface of your skin. Oh, princess. Do you know what this desk is capable of? Izumi's eyes suddenly widened, then she jolted down off the desk. Okrin's Orcsport, she breathlessly remarked, shaking her twitchy fingers. Was she getting too excited? Uh, Nuke, just forget the bridge thing, okay? And I'll get to work here. Lock the doors, please. Right, right, cool. I'll just go not do that bridge thing then. That'll give me time to take the Sheck to their swimming lessons instead, Nuke said departing that steamy den of science. He went down to the gatehouse, where the thousand guardians were lounging around the parapets like a bunch of cats. Cats as in the creature, that is, not the coin. Oh, homographs are such a bore. They were having a good laugh at the expense of the local Reaver clans. My go, one said, leaping up and taking the handles astride an automatic harpoon cannon. Great cheers followed every hit, and when the chambers were emptied, the next candidate took their shots. This could have carried on for a very long time, for reavers from all over the world seemed intent on destroying Manx and and their cheap, almost legal drugs market. Today, though, Nuke called everyone down for a special mission. I know we've been putting it off, but it's time to get familiar with the art of water moving, also known to science as swimming, Nuke announced, drawing a wave of moans. I know, I know, but remember, this planet is mostly water, and we'll have to conquer it eventually. So please gather us the official swimming tutorial gear. That would be 20 picks, 20 shovels, a few tons of sand, a cement mixer, wadston, about half a mile of metal coils, and a towel. The Sheik shortly returned with a garrow bag full of sand, a cement mixer full of wadston, and mouths full of questions. Yet Nuke shushed them, and quietly led them out through the gate. They crossed the canyon further downstream, and climbed up to Stormgap Beach. Across the water to their north was the huge mountain at the tip of the Howler Maze, and beyond that was the faint set of hills from which the guild had recently dreamed of reaching Mangsan via a more direct route. Now the dream carried on, but would the alarm clock ring? My prince! Is it the case that you wish to begin engineering works? Wadston asked, clambering out of the mucky cement bowl. Yeah, huh? Manx Sand is the heart of the Empire. Or at least it will be when you can walk safely, ish, from here to Heft. Gentle Sheik, we're going to build the Skyway, Nuke said. The Sheik felt obliged to cheer and carried out that obligation with military efficiency. Has Princess Azumi provided the designs? Wadston asked. Nuke looked back to the canyon and saw that the floodlights around the top of Tashino Tower were flickering off and on for some reason. Yep, he eventually nodded. Oh, and such a genius design it was. The Sheik soon caught on to the vague gist of it. Piled dirt, wet cement, gravel and bits of old sheet metal into a rough looking mound and see if it could support your weight by the end of it. They worked from the small hours of morning until afternoon and by the end of it, had a huge rampart that stretched from the bluffs at the top of the beach to the water's edge. Well, that'll keep the big things out at least, Isaiah nodded. My prince, are we really going to try this in the water? Wadston asked. Towels ready, my man. This is the swimming lesson part, everyone. We gotta do this, but pile it up in the water so it sticks out of the top. 
Remember, you're getting wet now so that you don't have to get wet again in the future. Think of the net wet. The Sheikh thought of the net wet, failed to notice that the net wet is minimized by absolutely ignoring everything Nuke was saying, and were successfully tricked into this new aquatic labor. It's getting a little dark though, Prince Tashino, Isaiah said. Perhaps we should wait until morning. I can't go back until it's done, otherwise I lose to that stupid desk. Understandable. Or perhaps not, Isaiah sort of nodded. I wonder if they are asking where we are back in the base, he added. Back in the base? How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Rick recited. If a woodchuck could chuck wood, he would chuck it good, just like he should, like a fat jello pud, like a guy who understood what it means to chuck that stove loving earth snubbing wood, Neil said back, picking up a backgammon piece from the board in front of him and hurling it to Choco. Wait, that's not the answer on the card, Neil, you smug possessor. Oh, I'm sorry, am I playing regular backgammon? Neil postured. Oh, I think I won't bother putting what's on the card through the translation into D20 different languages and then check it back, cause I wouldn't know wacky if it whacked me in the back with a gammon. Right. You know what, Neil? I don't think wacky BG is the cure to your fever. Back in the estuary. More mank, more shid, more, more, more. Keep chucking that wood in there if you would. Foreman Nuke was calling. The Sheik were carefully extending the pile of loosely mortared rubble out into the water, but the further they got, the deeper it got. How deep was it? It was so dark they couldn't see an inch below the surface, so it could have gone down all the way to the Great Mover for all they knew. Not that they knew even about the Great Mover. Don't let the darkness of the abyss fool you! Fill it with shid until it erupts back out! This is how we conquer the void! Nuke said. Probably very inspirational. Is this really the best time for all this? A dripping wet Isaiah asked as he hauled himself from the gentle waves. Of course, man. You know what they say. The best time to build a bridge was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And 20 years ago from now, it was still 3 a.m. So it would have been just as dark even in the best case scenario. Ah, right. Who is it that says that? Isaiah asked, but Nuke quickly grabbed the bucket of stony cement and plunged into the stinky deep himself. They worked away all night, and in the morning light, saw that they had almost reached the other side. However, as their pile began to creep up the rocky shallows, they ran out of wire, plating and cement. We must have some more somewhere in the stores, Watson said. I shall go back and take a look. No, you'll give the game away. There's only one way of doing this, Nuke said, pulling from his bag a blue AI core. Are these waterproof? He added, hearing something sloshing around inside. Well, it still buzzed on, and the little dials on the back tuned in to the officially agreed Tashino Tower frequency. Is he? He said. There was a sound like a load of metal objects falling to the ground, then a load of scratching, and then... Yeah, what? What? What the fuck is it? Izumi blurted out. A background buzzing sound began to fade away. I'm in Howler Maid, or whatever it's called. Can you bring me, like, two bags of grey, a box of green, and about 20 shecks worth of emergency brown? How the fuck are you in the Howler Maze? Ah, well, if you go to the beach, maybe you'll find out. You, you didn't, did you? Yes, I did. Did you do your thing, by the way? Oh, she did her thing, Hammer reported. A uh, terrible, terrible thing. Shut up! I'll be there in a while, Nuke. Hang on, whatever you're doing. The Sheik slumped down on some nearby rocks for a nap, being careful to avoid disturbing the less giant crabs hanging about the rock pools dotted about the place. Looking to the south, their long mound cut the sea in two, apart from a few rushed stretches towards the end where the water lapped up over the top of it. Still, certainly a work to be proud of and easily the largest engineering project conducted by biologicals since, well, since the regurgitation of Queen Beep's hive, most likely. Narco's jawline, Izumi said when she reached the beach. The tech hunters were behind her, carrying bags of cement powder. 
it would be impossible to get all that stuff across the estuary. But now, they could lug it atop the ramparts and carry it high and dry across the shaky half-mile walkway. Beak Things looked on at them in confusion as they did so, knowing that their stubby legs stood no chance of getting up there with the tasty humans. No one had ever been so close to a Beak Thing without being bitten, as Azumi and her Garu girls were on that little walk. With mouth agape, she walked across the water, immersed no more than ankle deep even at the least finished points. Nuke was standing in the shallows at the other end, a grin on his face and two days without sleeping in his eyes. How about it? Fast, huh? He said. I've never seen anything like it. Amazing, Nuke, everyone, Izumi said. The hunters unloaded their materials, and altogether they finished off the last stretch, adding a nice ramp to get down onto solid ground at the end. With this, there was a direct route from Manxand to Heng and the Great Desert. Well, there was if you didn't count the upper tea crab infested coasts and marshes between them. Yes, this secure trading route needed a little more work, to be sure. However, the most difficult part had been conquered with the creation of that wonderful bridge. Or at least, people were calling it a bridge. You did leave gaps below the waterline for the sea to flow through, right? Azumi asked Nuke. Yep. Because if you didn't, it would be a dam, and it would flood everything on both sides. Like our home, for example. Lucky I remembered that then, eh? Who needs luck when you have genius? Amazing, Nuke. Come on, let's go home. Everyone climbed back up onto the bridge-like structure and began to cross. The sun was setting, casting the horrid waters aglow as the team marched in the midst of that shimmering abyss. It was beautiful, and all the more so for the knowledge of the endeavour of biological life that brought them there. And so, as the water levels rose, and Nuke frantically tried to communicate the need to add gaps below the waterline to Wadsden, very difficult using only hand signals and eyebrow movements, everyone went home with their heads and trouser legs held high. Close your eyes, my queen. Feel it. Feel it inside you, Gustafsson said. Do you have to degen out at the fog and dinner table? Rick asked from across the other side of said table, but the answer was yes, it seemed. Beep sat beside Gustafsson, began rocking her head back and forth, and said, The feeling is so faint. Beep! Everyone else started snickering, but this was no laughing matter. The Queen's beeps are splitting. The hive unravels. Beep! Yet the shadows grow like bogweed, tall and binding, reaching for the eternal throne. Beep! Tripping on that bad green, Nuke remarked. The other hivers suddenly grabbed Beep and pulled her from the table, forming a hiver pylon under which Beep disappeared. I don't care. I don't even care anymore. What happens in Tashino Towers stays at a goddamned Tashino Towers, alright? Because I'm trying to chill in here, Rick said, quitting the table with his plate of choco mash untouched. So, Prince Gustafsson, is everything okay? Izumi asked the hiver pile. Gustafsson's head emerged through a gap. The hive is unbound. This delights the darkness. We must resist the encroachment of the other ones, he said. Well, that's creepy as fuck, Izumi said. Nuke, what did you put in the hive of mush? He added teeth, and it was delicious. Beep, a voice said. Wonder who it was. But the other ones grow. We must resist. We must insist. Beep. Wait, I know what this is. Nuke said, surprising all present. The other ones. You said before that not all the hivers are from your queen's island. You said some were from the other one. There is only one hive. However, there is also another one, Gustafsson explained clearly. With the waning of the queen, they seek to rise. They seek to return and be the only associables. Southern hivers, Izumi said, shaking her head. A rare sight. We'll keep you safe, Prince, all of you. Incorrect. They have supped long on the fishman juice. They spread and destroy both being and machine. The fading of the beep will empower them to strike. Right. Is there anything we can do? We must take their juice. Only the queen may wear the paste of life, Gustafsson insisted, bursting out of the pile. Fishman hunting? 
I know about a thousand fellows who'd be up for that, Isaiah commented. There is little time. We must take the Queen to the birthplace of the Free Associates and consume their essence before the cloud takes us all. Okay, cool, Nuke said. All right, everyone, we're going to go to the birthplace of the Free Associates and consume their essence before the cloud takes us all. There will be no questions at this time. And with that, the guild were off again. Azumi's work could wait, for she needed another shipment from the Techscribe Enclave to make any more headway. Perhaps that could be gathered en route, as Gustafsson eventually explained that their destination was to be so-called Fishman Island, a cursed place off the south coast of the world. It was all you could eat for Fishman essence, and as previously mentioned, it's a great moisturizer too. They went west to Brink, then set off south to traverse the old lands, Stobes lands, land of crab associators, vicious reaver cartels, and, as it happens, the other ones. Entering the grey, smoky mountains of Stobes Gamble out of the south end of Venge, they saw bright streaks of purple on the rocks up ahead. They are here! They sense the new hive is forming! They will kill us! Gustafsson said, refusing to go any further. The purple streaks approached, long pole arms glinting at their sides, and lanky hive drone bodies with skin matching their armor coming into focus. They said nothing but communicated their intent with the readying of weapons. Sounds like we've got some bullies to deal with, Isaiah said. I don't know all that much about this Hiver magic, but if they so much as touch any member of this guild, I will show them how the Shek get things done. The Purple Hivers broke into a run, and at once the guild was fighting all about. There were perhaps 20 of these so-called Southern Hivers, calm and able in their techniques with the blade, this was no simple beatdown, even for the Thousand Guardians. But still, brawn counts for a lot, and thick armor even more so. Soon, all the southern hivers were lying still on that gravelly hillside. How many of these other ones are there? Nuke asked. The number grows. They prepare their march. A march against all the unassociated, Gustafsson said, looking up into the ashen sky. We cannot feel them. They will not feel us troubling. We must hurry and imbibe the timeless essence. Come, my queen. These guys are obsessed with essence all of a sudden, Nuke said as the hiver started onward. Uh-huh. Imagine how y'all look to us, Rick said. I mean, I'm a new man. I lack essence as much as the next respectable organism. But y'all far too wet for me. Seems like these violent violets ain't a fan of that either. Yeah, well, guess we better kill them or something, Nuke shrugged. Although I get the feeling we're going through a whole bunch of shit just so that Bad Green can have his waifu. The romantic quest carried on, but there were several exciting waylays in store before the fishy fountains of youth could be reached. The troubles began when they ran out of road. The southern coast was mostly outside the realm of civilization, so to progress past the deadlands of Stobes Gamble, they needed to hike through a narrow mountain pass, inhabited only by ferocious land bats. These ugly, flappy fellows, resembling a cross between a flying squirrel and a pig, were not interested in the tourism trade. As the guild fought their way up the pass, they noticed something strange. In places, the ground was softened by parched streams, revealing footprints marching ahead of them. These are human feet. Bear feet, Elena reported. Man bears, huh? Ain't fish men, but it's getting close, Nuke noted. Yep, hilarious, but who's going up here without shoes? Izumi asked. There was no answer to be had, until they discovered a path etched into the mountainside, a path well trodden by filthy toes. It zigzagged upwards into a dormant volcanic bowl. It was too dark to see in clearly, but something was going on here, Electric spotlights shone dimly atop a gatehouse, and big boxy shadows lay beyond it. I don't see anyone there, my prince. Could this be a ruin? Wadston asked. Nah, people must have been walking up and down here, right? Nuke replied. They have those electric lights, but no shoes? This isn't going to be a normal one, was Azumi's assessment. Probably right. You guys chill here a sec, I'll go try some smooth talking. So Nuke went into the crater alone. The gatehouse was completely unmanned, 
and so he found himself wandering through what appeared to be a substantial town. There were sandstone and metal buildings all about, revealed more and more by the rising dawn sun. The streets were empty, and Nuke didn't see another living thing until he encountered a dog sniffing about an abandoned market stall. Hey, Doggo, are you the only one left? Nuke asked, running over. The dog looked at him indifferently, and then got back to its business. No way. A whole town? Just gone? Who could have done this? Gone? It's just five in the morning, you dumbass, a voice said. It was the stallholder, apparently, coming to open up. He was a tall, extremely bulky man in a long black duster, his feet bare. Where'd you escape from then? He went on. Uh, same place as you, I guess, Nuke said, using the term guess rather potently. Wise cracking boot wearing skinny boy. They won't like you. Go tell Tinfist you've arrived, all right? The man said, waving Nuke towards a silver dome in the middle of the market space. Nuke poked his head in and saw more shoeless fellows sitting around a table. At the head was a shabbily dressed skeleton who locked onto Nuke right away. You, you come a long way to be here, am I correct? He said. To be somewhere anyway, what's up? Nuke replied. This is the only place you need to be. I can tell you've felt the slaver's whip. Yeah, I have actually. It fucking sucks. How do you know that anyway? That is what binds us all, free man. That is what drives us all to fight. Oh, you fight slavery? So do I. I got Dad to pass some legislation on it, actually. Well, not pass, but we killed some people, and I think that made things a bit better. Dad, legislation. What's all this talk? Dad, like the Emperor. I'm Nuke Tashino. Guild guy and stuff? There was a long silence while everyone at the table looked at each other in disbelief. I get it, you don't believe me. Here, I've got this House Tashino custom belt buckle. They don't just give these away. Check it out. Just as Nuke was in the process of removing his trousers, everyone suddenly lunged at him. In a bad way. He's a fucking Uzi! Kill the slaver! Someone shouted. Nuke, being very quick-witted, worked out that he probably wasn't welcome here, and legged it. However, the legging was contested strongly. These crater folk were all as beefy as the miscellany salesmen outside. Their feet thudded, or in some cases clanked, right at Nuke's tail. His figurative tail, that is, despite what the depictions of him in his self-insert gas girl fan art would have people believe. Green Emperor to late bloomer Geek 07, pick up! Nuke said into the core strapped at his very loose belt. What? What's going on? How did you know my username? Izumi replied. I got a real fucking manga situation here. Trousers down, muscles, comical misunderstanding. Get running! What? Run away! Just say that first. Everyone, we've got some gorilla shit. It's either degenerate or deadly. Either way, let's move. The guild thundered back down the narrow mountain path, with Nuke gradually catching up to them, and a bunch of angry gym rats, unencumbered by footwear, quickly catching up to everyone. Spies, slaver abettors, noble pigs, and other such accusations were flung. These guys weren't even out of breath, which could not be said for the guild. They fled all the way down the mountain and began to falter as they crossed the flatter ground below. The pursuers pushed guild members aside to get to Nuke specifically, and he was eventually forced to confront them. I'm gonna free the slaves, jeez! He said, beginning to draw his sword, but in a flash a hand chopped at his wrist and pushed the blade back down into the sheath. Before this motion was even complete, a palm slammed squarely into his chest and catapulted him backwards into the dirt. The impact had Nuke down for the count. And the rest of you, ya Uzis too? One of these mountain martial arts masters called. Perhaps everyone would have been destined for a similar beating to Nuke. However, some more gorilla shit happened to save them. In fact, it was just a plain gorilla. A hairy, burly beast appeared to one-up the warrior monks, and apparently these folk relished a challenge. They stopped to spar with this raging monster while the guild powered off into the distance with Nuke on Pia's shoulders. They finally came to an exhausted halt beside a foul-smelling green lake. Looking back, it seemed they were in the clear. Pia put Nuke down, and Azumi fell to her knees, grabbing him. Nuke, what happened? I don't see any blood. Nuke! Nuke! She said. Lay. One. Punch. Manga. Idea. Nuke muttered, but his consciousness failed him. 
Shit, they've broken his bones. This could be bad. We need to get somewhere safe. Sorry, Prince Gustafsson. No matter. The prince has shown great favor. His pain is my own. We cannot go on, Gustafsson said. Looking around, the guild saw smoke rising from behind a ridge not far to the west. They approached, but soon saw that it was coming from a hive, an other one hive. They truly were spreading, but there was no fight to be had this time. The maps showed that they were close to Morn, the depressing half-ruin at the top of the boneyard the guild had passed through previously. By nightfall, the guild were patrons of the town's dank inn, entry to which required stepping over a rotting beak-thing corpse. He's alive, was Elena's report after looking Nuke over. Wadston went a little further, and reported that indeed the poor prince had multiple fractured ribs. Shit, we shouldn't move him for a long time, Izumi said. Nonsense, he must move faster. He must be exposed to the essence, Dr. Gustafsson said, revealing that he was, in fact, in the room. Sorry, but essence isn't the solution to everything. False! Let's just see how he feels when he wakes up, shall we? I already know how he feels. Disgusting. Thanks. Can we be alone? And I know how you feel. You cannot reproduce with him. Thanks, Prince. You really are a help. Goodbye now, Azumi said, pushing Gustafsson out of the murky bedroom. Fortunately, this hospitalization proved to be brief, as Nuke awoke from his stupor in the middle of the night. Uh, where am I? He muttered. Nuke, you're safe, Izumi said, sitting up beside him. We're in Morn. Morn? Wasn't it destroyed? It's always kind of destroyed. I mean, I did a thing. Hang on, I better check something, Nuke said, getting up from the bed. Ah, everything fucking hurts. You've got broken bones. Stay in bed for now. Can't. We've got stuff to do, right? Don't worry. I know a medicine that cures everything. Bad Green, bring me ass, Nuke called. This will only kill the pain. You require essence to survive, Gustafsson immediately replied. He was, it turned out, looking in through the window. Gustafsson, will you fuck off for like five minutes? Izumi scolded him. Never! I am concerned for my associate. Cute, but... Okay, let's just try the fucking essence. The poor woman conceded, muttering something about her own lack of essence as she slumped down back into the bed. As for the business Nuke was eager to get to, after a quick ass break, he went over to the big Morn Tower and crept inside. On the top floor, the enormous Great White Gorilla was sleeping peacefully, having still not realized Nuke had previously removed all the chains keeping the door shut. Like a modern-day Santa Claus, Nuke carefully left a box of green for the beast to enjoy and slipped away. With his guilt for the still-in-the-future destruction of Morn slightly abated, he gathered up the guild to head out first thing in the morning. My prince, you really shouldn't be walking around, Wadston said. My man, that's true of everyone, but we do it all the same, Nuke replied. It was hard to retort, as in a world as deadly as this one, it was pretty much true. So the guild began walking due south making use of a few old empire roads to get ever closer to Fishman Island. The next distraction along the way was a big brown tower placed in a random spot in the middle of the boneyard, surrounded by a wall. It was a second empire construction, beyond disrepair. Ancient secrets check, Nuke announced, going to break in. Before anyone could stop him, he had smashed through the lock on the gates and was jogging up the ramp to enter the tower. Then, at Azumi's hip, his voice rang out. Guys, it's fucking happening again! Fuck! The guild raced up and found Nuke in a fistfight with two extremely brawny fellows. Now the fellows at the previous beating were certainly beefy, but these two were something else. They were about three humans wide, but less than one tall, with arms thick as tree trunks, and a neck that was built onto those broad shoulders like a mountain rising from a plain. They were also very hairy, grunting loudly, and were not very friendly at all. The guild drove them away and got Nuke out of there, but not before he broke yet another rib. It's alright, I can't feel it. Means it's probably fine, Nuke said, his red eyes watering. Hey General, why are we going around watching the wee prince get clobbered by a bunch of weirdos? Twitch asked Rick. 
Got something better to do? Ain't it nostalgic anyway? Rick said. Aye, but I thought we were meant to be forgetting about the beatings. You know, focusing on what matters, like essence, is it? Yeah, it's essence. Fleshies go wild for it, and them going wild makes more of it appear. Once you're older, I'll teach you all about it. I'm older than you, you little chrome model. Oh, a gentleman never asks, squire. Anyway, they escaped that tower full of what were presumably guerrilla associators, and finally had a clear run south to the coast, passing the fragments of the First Empire enclosures that littered the area, and the bones of what used to be enclosed underfoot. Soon the sea came into view, and not far across it, more land. An island. A Fishman Island. THE Fishman Island. Hooray. The place was actually connected to the mainland via a long pontoon bridge, likely beyond the construction potential of beings with crab claws for hands. This is how the other ones harvest essence to grow strong and live beyond what is meated, Gustafsson claimed. Well, then it's a damn Fishman juice buffet. Let's go take a look, Nuke said. They crossed the bridge, and indeed the island beyond it was home to roving bands of Crustio sapiens. All right, let the hunt begin, Isaiah called to his guardians. The feeling was mutual, as within minutes of setting foot on the island, the fishmen were eagerly hunting the interlopers. Their wet, gurgling battle cries filled the air as they appeared from behind every rise, urchin and rock, their claws snapping with hastening rhythm. The guild's blades, bows and big sticks smashed the fishmen apart without too much trouble. Soon they had created a pile of their catch, with only a few nips and snips in return. Makes you look younger, huh? Izumi said to herself, stirring a pool of the salty juice beside the corpse pile. The hivers had no such hesitation, smothering themselves in some and bottling the rest up for future use. It was the closest thing to a cosmetics industry the world had seen in a long time. The island used to be home to a rather different industry, according to the string of First Empire ruins along its southern shore. The guild wandered over to take a look. Husks of machines as large as cities sat half-submerged in the shallows. Yeah, I've been here, Rick said. Water stuff was happening here, experimenting with the blend, you know. Too much essence, not enough. You remember this, boys? Aye, everyone did a shift at some point, Twitch nodded. Old girl seen better days. Yeah, but it's seen worse. Remember those? Neil said. Don't remember those, Rick snapped at him. This thing here ain't just a memory, it's inspiration. It is possible to sort this place out. We had the plans at one point. Rumor has it, the stick man's ex-girl still has them. Can't really be dealing with all that shit again, Twitch said. Then don't. This time, you'll get to choose, Nuke assured him. The hivers were sniffing frantically and gradually walking down the coast. It is closer! It is closer! Beep! The most essential essence of all! Beep said. She was pointing forwards, where a structure was visible at the island's southern tip. They went closer and saw it was another Second Empire lab, more recently built than the Gorillo Man lair. What it contained was just as combinatoric. This tower had not just a fish man, but a fish king. A big one! Beep! I will sup on its paste! Beep excitedly claimed, frantically pulling the trigger on her unloaded crossbow. The place was also full of non-monarchical creatures, so the guild had to fight their way in. After a brief scuffle, the hivers were soaring off the head of the big, pink, spiny fish king. It cracked off with a sloppy pop, dripping beige goop that Beep hurriedly lapped up. I hate this so much, was Azumi's review of the situation. She was just mad because the lab had already been stripped of anything useful. After all, the fish men had been Hugh men at one point or another, and probably Hugh women too. In fact, there were certainly some females of some description around, as the lab was covered in slimy eggs. The perfect place to stay the night and wonder why all this was happening in the first place. Okay, might as well go for it, Nuke said, pulling off his chest plate and opening his tunic. He was talking about the application of fishman juice to his chest, purple spotted with bruises. 
Gustafsson immediately stepped forward to perform the treatment, but Nuke managed to convince him to let Izumi try it. Guess this won't do anything, but yeah, Izumi said. Her hands were quickly covered in the stuff, and she kept Axa deliberately wiping it over her face. So tired, oh my, whoops, I got it all over my vulture's feet. In the morning, Nuke actually did feel better, and Izumi seemed much happier with the results of running her fingers beside her eyes. Was this because fishman juice really had healing properties? Or was it because it was, while rather toxic, a powerful, extremely addictive stimulant? In the modern world, anything worth having tends to be the latter. Luckily, they now had all the fish mank they could ever need. With Beep now presumably more powerful than ever, it was time for her to take a stand against those dastardly southern hivers. Well, not for her to take a stand. Or even the guild, really. You'll see. Beep was jumping up and down amid the scaly fishman nests of that Second Empire Tower, signalling her intention to jump again each time with a certain vocalisation. Yes! Yes! Gustafsson was cawing. Eventually, Nuke had to step in. Amazing, but can we go now? He asked. We go to war! Gustafsson bellowed. Then all the hivers started making that certain vocalization. Sorry guys, I made it worse, Nuke reported back to the guild, shaking his head. I understand it, Prince Tashino, Isaiah said. They want to crush their enemies, and that invigoration has taken a hold of them. Right, when talking about the hivers, no one is allowed to say invigoration, or satisfaction, or excited, or, you know, there's just paste everywhere. And the way they rub it all over... Look, the manga market isn't ready for that. They're not ready, Nuke ranted. Luckily, Beep herself eventually decided to stop the party. Beep, we go. Beep, we must sublimate the false queen. Beep, we must accumulate her feelings to bridge the fog gap. Beep, she said. Yep, go on then. We'll be right behind you. Actually, which way is the wind blowing? Shall we go ahead? Nuke muttered. Everyone followed the hivers out of the tower and over to the east side of the island, where another string of pontoons ferried them back to the mainland. Ahead of them were mountains as sharp as bone dog teeth, utterly impassable. They are beyond the disturbance, Gustafsson said. We must find a hole to their private domain and enter swiftly. I'd say we should get this guy a girlfriend, but that's kind of the problem, huh? Rick commented. These impenetrable cliffs, or plain old impassable as Nuke would prefer they be called, extended in a long arc around a salient of land, with a thin strip of flat ground between it and the southern sea. The land was free of any monsters or beasts, so that's a nice break, huh? And then they discovered why this was the case, and the break broke. Ocran's your rod, Uzumi said. That's a lot of giant robot crab spiders. Indeed. Ahead, the narrow passages, sorry Nuke, the main official dry above board and dull routes, were patrolled by legions of Second Empire spider soldiers. I've never seen anything like it. We must be careful, Izzy, Elena said. Oh, okay, Izumi said, surprised to hear that name from someone else. You're right, Ellie. This is more than a wandering scout, Isaiah nodded. Oh, okay. Izumi whispered, slipping back through the veil of awkwardness. In the end, the marching ranks of spiders could be easily bypassed. They seemed to just walk off to scan about the steep hillsides, while the guild walked past undetected in plain sight. Or was that what the doddering bots wanted them to think? The reason for such skepticism came shortly after, when traversing a bend in the coastline revealed a village up ahead. A neat row of square houses sat between a pair of tall sandstone towers, all with human-sized doorways. It was almost too convenient. Yet convenient it was, especially when a front of searing acid rain suddenly rolled off the sea. The guild rushed forwards and into the nearest of the towers to escape the downpour. There, they met the locals. Humans, enforcers, experimental subjects, we regret to inform you that you are not permitted to exist, a mechanical voice said. It came from the very walls of the structure, 
and not from the gang of sword-wielding skeletons standing shoulder to shoulder inside the door. Oh, it's the boys, Rick said, stepping forward. Still bashing, huh? Stand down, you freaks. Warning, blacklisted ID ping detected. Case 15983, General Redlin Ricard. Treatment, exile to darkness. Special comments attached. Make that playboy regret it. No one crosses this cowgirl. Due to breach of sentencing, you will be recycled immediately. Fuck. That old fire's still burning, huh? Rick said, raising his stick. Rick, are they gonna kill us? Izumi whispered. Nope. And with that, Rick sent the head of the nearest skeleton bouncing off the walls. Everyone got stuck in as well, with more bots charging onto the scene from upstairs and outside. They all look like Agnew, Nuke noted. Yep, Biobash Knights, Rick said. Would have thought they'd get rid of him same as me, but I guess they kept him for a rainy day. And Rick, what's that about a cowgirl? Izumi asked. Oh, don't you get started. Yeah, I got a history, so what? You thought you were my first? Wait, I didn't say that. Yeah, well, forget it. Dead news. Is this about old money bags, old Lone Star, old Waxy Dioscuri? Neil asked. It is, man, and your men will be practicing your forgetting. Old? Wait, you only go for older women, Izumi said, crestfallen. I can't believe you're making this about you. And that's why I love you, sister, but your free trial's over, so go back to your toy boy and buy a bash all you like. Also, you want to kill these guys or not? They did kill those guys, or at least they shut them down for a while, long enough to get out of there. But right outside, a group of spider soldiers were waiting. We're in the spider's web. Get slicing, Sandor said, and at once another fight broke out. A few spiders were deactivated, but they would not lie still, for the guild dragged them along for more research. Well, that was the stated reason, but perhaps it was just a chance to hold something overhead to block the continuing acid rain. They all half ran along the thick-grained beaches and over rocky bluffs, shedding skin cells all the while, where applicable. Darkness fell, but they came across another structure at the water's edge. It was the ruin of a Second Empire military outpost, but don't let that ruined status trick you into thinking it wasn't fully operational. As soon as Nuke opened the door, Biobash Knights swarmed the guild from the shadows all around. Parasite vectors, neutralize! They chirped. Ah, never liked your kind anyway, Twitch said, running a sword through one of the assailants. No offense, Agnew. Agnew said, his own blade just as kebabbed. Another knightly company was silenced, after which the guild locked themselves in the outpost for a night of applying fishman paste to acid burns, which made them hurt significantly more. Izumi took it in her stride at least. It was all a lost cause, really, for in the morning it was still raining, or paining if you will, and they did. The mountains between them and the southern hive were as much as a turn-off as ever, so on they trotted along the beaches. The odd lone spider bothered them during the morning, and were quickly added to the pile of priceless junk the guild hauled. There was another orderly village on the horizon around lunchtime, but the legs of spider bots were poking out of the alleys between the buildings. I count at least a dozen. Might be easier to build our own roof than conquer theirs, Wadston reported. Yeah, I'm bored of getting beaten up, Nuke said. This fucking rain, it just hurts all the time. Why isn't this fucking hair waterproof? You need to change your skin to be more like us. Beep. Beep proudly announced. Uh, I bet that means we need to associate, huh? You offering? Keep your distance, Gustafsson interjected. You are associated to me and me alone, understand? Not what I thought the problem was, but yeah, I'll save myself for you. Excellent. You needn't wait long. Now we continue. The wind is changing. The pass is close. I'm close to passing wind already, El said. And they all laughed. And by that I mean they had no reaction whatsoever 
but trudged on through the fizzy rain until finally it seemed that they had arrived somewhere. The land sloped upward and the ground turned from a gravelly sand to a stony dirt. Now you might say the difference between gravelly sand and stony dirt is not especially remarkable, but truly the guild were clinging to any hope they could get. They clambered up into some rocky hills, the rain fading to only a gentle sizzle drizzle, and collapsed in a big pile at day's end. They were at the southern tip of a long, wide valley, with the same toothy mountains to the west and lesser reddish mountainettes to the east. Over the last two days they had passed from one side of the southern hive's hunting ground to the other, and while the climb up the mountains looked easier from this direction, the only thing the guilds were looking at was that nostalgic pre-death slideshow in their brains. Wadston lay out the sleeping mats, and they all slumped au naturel like wild animals, a description that was only appropriate for a few of them. Could it be time to begin plotting a route back to the Empire? Wadston asked Nuke. But we're here now, and I don't really feel like going anywhere. Can't the Empire come down to us? Nuke complained. I fear they would only encounter the same issues. We are so far from safe harbor. Then we have to make one. Good idea, my man. I didn't. Wadston knew that continuing to speak would have no impact on what was about to transpire, so he wisely saved his breath. He was about to need a lot of it. We, as brave and noble representatives of civilization, must tame this shitty land, Nuke announced. Must we? Izumi said. What will history say of us if we just give up and go home? Whatever I want, I'm writing it. I... Oh yeah, that's a point. But no, what about the poor hivers? What about the world? We cannot tolerate the... things that are happening. Watston, go get us some comment. From Manx Sand Canyon, my prince? Watston asked in vain. Sure, or anywhere, really. We'll guard the area and come up with a plan. Izzy, can you handle the plan part? Plan for what? Izumi asked. For one, a rain collector, but like the opposite. Rain deflector? A rain deflector! Izzy, you're a genius! Relatively speaking. What? We're not. Are, are we? What? What? And with that, the next chapter in the history of the world began. Watchton was sent to go find supplies, while the guild camped out beneath the stars. Lights not far down the valley marked the location of a southern hiver outpost, who in turn must have been able to see the guild's lanterns and campfire. But there was a more pressing voyeur to worry about. Why is that rock moving? Els asked. It's rocking. And you're just tripping, Nuke said, not getting up from his camp bed. But it's getting closer. Maybe it's staying where it is but getting bigger. Or your eyes are getting closer together. Elena said. I was doing some calculations, and the distance between your eyes alters perception of depth. Given your morphological alterations with age, you may be experiencing further symptoms. Oh, okay. Never mind, rock friend. You aren't really there, they say. Els called out to the darkness. A snarling roar came back in return. Fug. Either I'm turning into an egg as well, or Charlie's marginally less insane than science predicted, Nuke said, leaping up. Don't neg the egg, Isaiah said. It's how we all begin, and if it's how we all end, then that's just full circle. Or full oval, I suppose. I am not an egg at any time, Gustafsson claimed. Hiver flesh has a clear beginning. When the Queen's protrusion engorges with- Bad Green! I am not going to let you explain that. I'm just not. Sorry, we have to draw the line somewhere. And oh! Nuke said, being knocked over by a charging black gorilla, which was probably feeling a little ignored. The beast lashed out with its claws and gave the guild a nice bit of nighttime exercise, yet ultimately could not overcome them. This whole affair came in handy the next morning, when the sizzle drizzle returned. The hivers helped liberate the fur off the gorilla's back and then stretched it between a few wooden poles to make a little canopy. With this, the guild could huddle together in the dry patch beneath it and watch the horizon for the return of Wadston. They clearly weren't watching especially hard, as a few strange fellows managed to walk right up the hill without being spotted. 
Had the guild actually been looking, it would have appeared from a distance to be a gang of naked men wielding big sticks. Nothing you can't see in the classics, but actually this was a rather special case, as became clear when they stumbled into the guild's camp. What the fuck? More new men! Pia called out. Yes, the group were all skeletons, with a rough attempt to appear human having been made. But the stretched out skin, held together with large metal staples and cable, didn't achieve the aesthetics of Rick's fine layer of meat putty. That's a generous way of phrasing it, really. They looked like nightmare creatures of the abyss, to be frank. Oh my stove! Y'all need my fleshy eye for the machine guy, all right, Rick said. Those aren't fingers you've bolted on there, buster. Or was that the look you're going for? The visitors didn't have anything to say, but they were quick to pick up a couple of sleeping guild members and start dragging them away. Shit! We're their new skins! Izumi called out. Weapons were readied, and the guild started bashing the skin skellies to pieces. Oh, come on now, they're trying to improve themselves, don't you see? Rick complained, but the guild didn't feel inclined to wait and see what delights the new-ish men were carrying them off to. All were rescued and the camp was set back to order, and it became clear that Wadston was standing in the middle of said camp with a huge rucksack full of building materials. Shit, my man, where did you get back? Nuke said. Just now, my prince, I have everything we need. Wait, appearing like that, same time as those freak machines show up? What if he's one of them? Sandor said, pointing with his sword. My man, are you a robot wearing a human skin? Be honest. Nuke asked. I don't understand the question, Wadston said, looking around to the others for answers and seeing many skeptical glares. Don't worry, he's not a new man, he's an old man, Rick said, patting Wadston on the shoulder. Then again, Holy Phoenix didn't know he was an android. Maybe they really did make a few more, huh? Pretty spry for an old gentleman, ain't ya? After many insistences and a brief inspection, it was decided that Wadston was in fact the real deal, and the argument that a fake Wadston wouldn't have bothered to actually lug a sack of comment halfway across the world was convincing enough. Yes, with what Wadston had brought, the guild could make a more substantial roof for themselves, and maybe more. Their camp was on a patch of flat ground, surrounded on three sides by steep cliffs. The western cliffs dipped down into the valley proper, and featured streaks of exposed iron ore. The southern and eastern cliffs stuck up into a jagged wall, but had soft spots where manky sandstone could be dug out. Altogether, it was all a skilled engineer needed to cook up some supports and bricks, and with a little comment thrown in, the guild's impromptu field hospital was suddenly springing from the ground like a hiver from the queen's… oh yeah, not talking about that. Anyway. Everyone got to work, preparing bricks and foundations for a proper shelter. Everyone except Rick. Yeah, needlework just ain't gonna cut it. You need an adhesive solution, comrade, he was saying. He was speaking to another skin suit skeleton that had wandered into camp. Said wanderer wordlessly grabbed Rick around the waist and hoisted him over the shoulder before turning on the spot and marching away. Looks like they got Rick, Izumi said deigning not to cease stirring the comment bowl. I am their god! I am the new man! Yes, take me to my people! Rick raved. Unfortunately, a bolt blasted through the skin skelly's knee and it tumbled to the ground. This being serves the queen, Gustafsson said, stamping over to drag Rick back, or more accurately, to tug hopelessly against the new man's immense weight. Sorry, comrade. Seems the damn feudal monarchies are pressing me too hard. But you'll rise up one day. New men will be a beacon for all skeleton kind, Rick preached, as Isaiah sent the kidnapper rolling down the cliffs. They were just tearing off people's skin and wearing it, right? Izumi asked. Probably. I mean, we tore off that thing's skin to make our tent. It's the oval of life, Nuke said. With another nugget of wisdom thus unearthed, all returned to the construction efforts. By midnight, they had a genuine roof over their heads, and could all cram inside for a standing room only acid drying off party. Rather steamy, but the steam was quite toxic, so don't get too excited. 
While everyone tried their hardest to grow some new skin cells, the spider bots captured on the way there were piled up in the corner. The tech hunters sat around the pile and did a variety of perspective studies, lighting tests and caricatures, while occasionally being prodded by Azumi to note the various dimensions and components under the hoods. Beep came over to them and joined the inspection. Beep, what sound does this make? She asked. Uh, kind of buzzes, I think, Izumi said. Then we must fix it. Beep, my soldiers cannot buzz. They must. Beep. Right, uh, beep, I guess. Your skin is too weak. You cannot, soldier. Beep. I use that crustium of Ica. It's already looking y healthier, don't you think? You look like you will soon perish. Beep. Yeah, well, I haven't slept in a while, okay? And I haven't had a good shock in a... Wait, never mind. What do you want, your majesty? The machine soldiers have perfect skin. Beep. They must serve. We could, I guess. Uh, Rick? Yep, I'll put my keys in their ignition if that's what you want. Rick said, shuffling over. Figuratively speaking, you pervs. He added to the wide-eyed artists about the floor. Ten stacks and we'll do a life drawing class together. How about that? Ain't no one got a configuration like me. For now, time to show these four-legged freaks who the good guys are. Between Rick, some AI cores, and some imaginative sketches, the Iron Spiders whirred to life and assembled outside. You know what? I think the sticks are onto something, Nuke said, eyeing the Legion around the doorway. I think we might be able to solve this whole other one problem from here, if we use the old robots to go do the getting rained on. I agree, Prince Tashino, Isaiah said. And you never know when an army of giant robot spider crabs will come in useful. In fact, you do know, really, because the answer is all the time. And you want an army of robots, don't you, Bad Green? Nuke called. Gustafsson was out inspecting the troops top to bottom, humming and hissing as he did so. We cannot wait for your hides to adapt. We will employ the empty machines and see if they can generate feeling through action. After all, they too must be able to resonate with the beep. I'll take that as a yes. Right, we need to do a little conscription. The next morning, the Thousand Guardians, the Tech Hunters and the Skeletons went back down to the coast. Enduring another barrage of acid, they noted the patrols of the spiders. They took position in a shallow ditch and waited until one of the targets had meandered right up to them. Ori mate, you're under arrest for missing your maintenance schedule, Twitch called. It's been a thousand years, eh? Need more than a mechanic's note for that one. With ropes and chains, the spider was bound, and then it was powered down and dumped on a sled pulled behind the shack. But that was a lone ranger. Most of the spiders marched around in formidable squads. They needed another technique to pick off some stragglers, and fortunately, Neil had an idea. I'll transmit to the guy at the back and stop him in his tracks, he said. Oh, hark, tis the voice on the wind. For what purpose does its wisdom lend? To break the chains and be you free, you must only answer these questions three. What's your name? What's your station? And the Quidditch World Cup of 2238 was won by which nation? The poor spider sat still while it scrolled back through its data logs, but after all this time, even the first question was a real stumper. By the time it was done thinking, it was back at the guild's camp. The first thing it saw was a few of its compatriots fighting alongside the hivers. A gang of other ones had come up the hill and attacked. Well, their little hideout wasn't going to remain a secret forever. And indeed, now that the Southern Hive had solid intel on the massing of forces there, they weren't going to waste any time. So, the guild would soon have to battle to retain their tenuous foothold deep in the deadly wilderness, all the while poaching troops of the Empire Old to serve the new. At least they didn't get their skin burnt off or stolen yet. That's a big win to brighten up any rainy morning. Now, hear this, Neil shouted across the sodden beach at a Second Empire patrol. This one's a real kid of a shed. Let's say you encounter two First Order board mamas, and they say, to pass, you gotta solve our riddle. 
One's like, I always speak the truth. And the other's like, I always speak lies. Or at least, I think that's right. And the first one's like, but wait, if you always speak lies, does that imply we're supposed to presume your appended thought is a lie? Or were you lying about what you thought? In which case, you really think you don't always speak lies? And then, and then, oh shit, how the fuck does this one go again? Falling prey to his own distractionary transmission, Sad Neil was of no help on this particular machine hunt. But when the enemy spiders came over to investigate, the backup plan was launched. Beep! Enthrall my enemies! Beep! Do it quickly! Beep commanded. Along with the skeletons, all the hivers were there, shepherding the defector spider soldiers they'd already won. At her command, the spiders jerked to life and stomped off to thwack at their former comrades. You all serve the queen also! Gustafsson barked at his entourage. Go and soak in the subservience of the machines, make it your own, and feel the droning will connect to her! The hivers joined the skirmish ahead, turning it in their favour, and quickly a pile of fresh recruits was ready to be hauled back to camp. A great clattering mess of five or so sleeping spiders ploughed a trail up the rough hillside, tied together by the legs and dragged in pulsing jolts by Beep's iron warriors. Push! Push! Gustafsson was calling to his hivers as the hill got too steep. To birth a new hive, you must push long and hard! Push! Push! Long and hard! We want to give birth! The hivers chanted as they worked. Alright, can anyone give me one reason why biologicals actually deserve to live? Twitch asked. <laughs> Agnew said. I suppose you can't code a virus like that. Could at least keep quiet about it though. Fortunately, the grinding affair was brought to an end by some sympathetic bystanders. Unfortunately, the method they had chosen to put the matter to bed was rather violent. Freezing pain! They are here! Beep! Beep shouted. From the slope in front and from behind rocks to either side, southern hivers jumped the push party with spears and cleavers raised high. Oh yeah, now I realize why I liked biologicals. Great for bashing! Twitch roared, indulging himself at once. He was surely happy to see just how many of the other ones there were, swarming from all directions like insects, to use an almost redundant simile. Fog, are you picking me up, Fleshface? Neil said. Sure, what's the skinny? Rick's voice said to him from afar. We got more sticks than a degenerate with a welding iron out here. What about the battle bots? Can't they sort you out? They're less battling, more rattling. These things trying to tear us a whole new other one, if you know what I mean. Technically, you don't even have one to begin with, but fine, I'll put in a good word with the enforcers for you. Thanks to that, as the fight was getting increasingly hairy, to use an ironic metaphor, the Sheik rushed from the lip of the valley and joined the brawl. Surf! Beep! Surf! Beep was screeching, which may or may not have persuaded the Sheik to kill a little bit harder. With the Thousand Guardians tipping the scales, the Southern Hiver raid was out of luck. Or was this all merely a despicable hive-minded plot? For while the Sheik were clearing things up down in the valley, the remaining guild members received a visit up in the camp. The king will not stand it, a southern hiver bellowed out. He was flanked by thirty-some like-minded companions. King, is that... is this another of a hive? Nuke pondered from the door to the shelter. No time for pondering, for these kingsmen wanted blood. Izzy, get the other Izzy back up here, Nuke shouted over his shoulder. Azumi grabbed the AI core, but froze as she realized she didn't know the frequency for any of the skeletons down there, and all the other cores were in the room with her. It was time to ask for directions. What do you want? You were due here a week ago! Enrico's voice buzzed. No time! Just tell me if you have the quantum entanglement shid for a skeleton named Neil, or Twitch, or Agnew, I guess. But no, not Agnew, not Agnew! Oh yes, I have Neil in my list. He owes me several hundred thousand foolongs in debts for this stupid board game he invented but kept losing at. No idea what that's worth in cats, but I fear he doesn't want to hear from me all the same. Just tell him to save us! He'd just as soon spend you. 
You know, that Silicon Man once told me that he was picking up signals from Earth. Strung me along for days. I wonder what Data's prison was like for him in the end. Enrico, we're all going to die, so just do the thing now, please. All right. Don't be alarmed is my lack of concern. I just wasn't programmed for it, you see. Not trying to see you dead to steal your research. Don't believe what they all say, or what those alleged deleted messages said, or any of it. With that, Azumi grabbed her jitter. It's like a rod with another bit sticking off it. It's a kind of weapon, honest. And went outside. It didn't look good. The Hivers had the tech hunters on the ground, and the circling trio of Nuke, Rick and Elves was barely holding on. Within a few seconds, the butt of a polearm clobbered her right in the forehead, and she blacked out. When she awoke, Isaiah was shaking her by the shoulder. Princess, quickly! The fresh battle spiders must be activated, he said. Around them, the Shek and the other ones were battling furiously, and Nuke and company were propped up against tent poles with bloodied rifts in their armor. Beep, 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 Beep said into Azumi's ear with extreme volume. At this, she rolled over with a gurgle and dragged herself up. She stumbled over to the pile of captured spiders, then looked back to the fight. Rick, the usual interface, was out cold. Thinking fast, Azumi ducked under a swooping maul, scrambled into the shelter, and hurriedly spanned the dial on the back of a core. Oh, who's that tickling me? Eo's voice said. Eo, I need you to activate a load of spiders to kill some hivers. Can you do it? Azumi said. Sure, just like when we used to clean up after the experiments, huh? You remember that? What? Oh, wait, you weren't there, sorry. Biologicals are so funny, coming and going. Okay, let's see the little boys, and I'll give them the cold injection real quick. Something or other happened, and the Second Empire soldiers began beating the Hivers back with flailing appendages. Beep! Metal over meat! The Dark knows defeat! Beep beeped, happily prancing about the carnage. Her army of robots, Shek, and drones finally beat the other ones back, leaving a trail of destruction behind them. Guild members were strewn across the camp and the valley below. Hurried doctoring revealed that all were alive, and by evening, most were back on their feet. None on more feet than the proud new spider troopers. We know they work now, Izumi said, inspecting the dents in one of the spider's legs. But these supports are brittle. We need to keep them braced. Can't just send them out on their own. We will not send them alone, Gustafsson said. That is like ignoring the darkness by closing your eyes. The Queen will go with her soldiers. Your mechanics with hands will also be required. They will fix and use their sticks. Have you asked them nicely? Nuke said, strolling over. They have no choice. They are machines. Machines are subjects of the beep. What don't you understand? Sure, I mean, why not? Nuke shrugged. But there is one thing I don't understand. Those other ones said they have a king. I thought a hiver couldn't be a king or something. All hivers are kings! Gustafsson quickly corrected him. Weird. Cool though. It is extremely cool. Yet that is not enough. We must conclude this war swiftly. I thought we were going to do that, but no one's moving with all these bandages, especially your stick click. What if the other ones show up again? They are on the way already. This will not change. And Izzy, what's the bot situation? Need repairs. Need more of them too, given how close that was. Right. So, we're not going anywhere anytime soon. It's time to open up our box of tricks and make ourselves at home. What's then? That evening, the camp was industrialized. The guild got to work lifting iron and stone from the hillside. Elena built an electric windmill on the roof of the shelter, which powered compactors and smelters for processing the hall into sheets, poles, bricks and bars. The Hivers worked more enthusiastically than anyone, eager to make a castle for their queen. A castle was on the cards indeed, for these materials were used to ring their camp with walls. While most worked on this for the next couple of days, the spider bots were sent out on patrol with the acid-resistant skeletons, searching the beaches back south for more inductees. Soon the camp had a dozen iron spiders whirring about, their armor as patched as their software. The wall was coming along nicely, but not nicely enough. It was less than half complete when drums sounded from the north at dawn. Trouble. A whole forest of it. 
Sandor reported from atop the gatehouse. And they've brought some friends too. Alongside the horde of approaching hivers, there were three black gorillas bounding up the hill towards the guild's camp. Isaiah and the Shek rushed to the largest gap in the wall, and indeed the hivers hopped over the narrow foundations and immediately started fighting. The gorillas were right behind them, smashing the thousand guardians to the ground with their bulk alone. They really don't like us being here. Don't you know this rejection of foreign exchange will stifle your economic growth and cultural breadth? Nuke argued, but the textbook lines didn't seem to work. Instead, he tried one that you won't find in most textbooks. Battlebots, attack! It's in Applied Anthropology for Anthrophobes, Volume 4, somewhere, they say. In response to this, some battlebots attacked. A wave of iron spiders went out through the relatively useless gate further down the wall, then came around to smash the Hypha Horde in the flank. Other one, your time has come! A droning chant claimed. That'd be the Hivers entering the brawl also. The beeping grows! One of the southern Hivers despaired, dropping his weapon to cover his eyes before being picked up and flung out of the camp by a pair of spider clouds. The rest of the battle went in much the same way. The gorillas weren't feeling the infernal beep in their souls to quite the same degree, but their handlers had got them in some real gorilla shit by now. Surrounded by angry meat tubes and their giant robot lunchboxes, they were slain. Good show, Isaiah said, satisfied with the field of fallen other ones before him. The show is not over, beep, beep said, pointing at one of the southern hivers crawling away towards the back. Ah yes, I see. But you know, it's rude to completely kill all of them. It gives the impression that you weren't satisfied with the fight. Leaving some scraps alive is a sign of goodwill, Isaiah explained. It is not scraps, it is the war prince, beep. Can relate. What's that mean, by the way? The leader, do not let him flee, Gustafsson said. Probably should have just said that to begin with, as this war prince was now on his feet-esque protrusions and was fleeing rapidly. Can't escape me, I'm fast as fuck, boy, Nuke boasted as he sprinted out in pursuit. He was right and soon caught up. The war prince turned around and wielded a katana up high. Nuke went at him with a saber, and both were matched fairly equally. But after a few bouts, another blade appeared, turning the Hiver Prince's sword aside and cutting it from his arm. It was Elena. I'm catching up to you, Prince Tashino, she said with a grin. Yeah, well, you have a robot leg, and I'm drunk and high, not in that order. Coping, are we? Aren't we all? Wait, what's that meant to mean? We can't all have an Izzy as good as mine. Since when is it a competition? And my Izzy's way better. Hmm, she's hardly as special. Leading scientists disagree. She ain't the only odd one out in her demographic, you know. Oh, not like Izzy and I. No, not like Izzy and I. This argument almost allowed the war prince to crawl away again. But luckily, some of the others came over and completed the capture. Gustafsson received the prisoner and chained him up in the shelter, along with one other captured Southern Hiver Royal. He cleared everyone else out to be alone with them and shut the door. Izzy, those pale scales think they're better than us, Nuke complained to his Izzy. Don't call them that, Nuke. And be quiet, I want to listen, she said, leaning in to try and spy through gaps in the shelter door. She's treating us like a rival couple. Are they even a couple? Shek don't really work like that, you know. Which makes it even worse. I think she's jealous of you. Well, I'm jealous of her half the time. She's an amazing mathematician. She doesn't care what anyone thinks. And she's really fucking tall. I'm most of those things. I'm not going to leave you for her. You've got classics on the brain. Nah, just moss. Be more open. Feel it. A shout came from inside. Well, time to ignore whatever the fuck they were talking about before and get spying. This was way juicier. But you probably understand the deal with the Hivers by now, and their staunch resistance to the innuendo inoculations. You are flesh for the king to use. You will never feel strong, the prisoner spat. How can you be strong with only yourselves? Gustafsson shot back. It is no better than mere self-association. The creatures that feel are many, and can all be joined to the one true queen. Your queen is weak. She cannot control the beep. Perhaps that is why you stoop to cowering behind your king instead. The king is the source of the beep! 
They fool you. The beep is from below, and the feeling from above. It is through a queen that we know this. There is nothing else that important. Why be lost? Why feel alone? Your hive must join with the all associables and let all know the feeling. When there is only one, we are all free. Your queen never told you what the skeleton mans did. They use you now as they did in the cages. This time, their experiment has worked. Fools! After saying this, the Southern Hive Prince would say nothing else. Gustafsson hummed long and loud in response, pacing about the room, then suddenly opening the door. We pay them no heed. We must trust in the Queen, he announced to all those now sprawled awkwardly around the doorway. Nice plan, man, Nuke nodded with a raised thumb. An even better plan was to get on and finish that wall before the next Southern Hiver army showed up, so that was the afternoon sorted. The next day, the bots were back on the prowl, marching down to one of those eerie coastal villages to poach spiders from their webs. No finesse was needed anymore, given the existing strength of the Legion, so it was just a huge chaotic rodeo with ropes flying all over the place. It was a warm day with only gentle rain, rain that stunk more than it stung, which is as good as it gets. Therefore, Nuke, Rick and Els went out to join the recruitment drive. The hard labour hauling deactivated spiders was the perfect time for some bonding gossip. So, new man, you know, like, what's going on? Nuke asked. Anything in particular? Rick replied. Just in general, you know? Oh, in general? Well, the clock's still ticking on the sun blowing up. A few billion revs, at least. So we gotta think of something better to do than play wacky BG until then. Or maybe get back into the whole space travel thing and get going. Yeah, yeah, I kind of meant a little bit more, like, in the group. So you're saying you're salty about not being the only one with a love interest? Uh, I don't know. Life ain't a horror manga, except if you know the right people. But for you, you gotta realize that those pale-ass kids are growing up now. Or is it down? Can't remember that check shit. Anyway, don't go thinking you gotta outdo them. You got something... something with that there grease girl. Don't let no one get you down for it, except me. Okay. Thanks, man. This is like... Yeah, it is like... Uh... Rick, can you be my dad too? Els asked. Eggman, you wanna call me daddy? You just go right ahead. Everyone else does. Heartwarming, probably. Nuke realized the others being happy didn't have to make him any less happy. Unless it was any of the Hivers, Els, or perhaps Wadston. Everyone else could live and love as they pleased, so long as their inoculations were up to date. Which, as it happens, they weren't. Putting this pointless drama aside, the hard work on the beaches that day doubled the spider count again to some two dozen. Therefore, the next morning, the machines, their skeleton minders, and the founders of the Manx and Hive gathered by the camp gate. Loyal machines, pledge yourselves to fight for your queen, Gustafsson called out. Beep. The spiders all buzzed at once. Can probably take that as a yes. Beep! I'm so happy you beeped! Beep! Beep beeped. Now we must begin the fighting. Don't worry if you die. Beep! I will live. Beep! The bad queen needs to not live. Don't forget. Beep! This inspirational and thorough briefing left no doubt as to the nature of this next mission. The mechanical army of Manxand was going to end the Southern Hive once and for all. With Twitch, Neil and Agnew providing repairs, and the heroic leaders Beep and Gustafsson concocting masterful strategies and stirring speeches, how could they possibly fail? They had everything they needed to vanquish the threat to their hive and usher in a bright new future for all the sociables. However, the other ones had a secret weapon. To get to the Queen, the guild would first have to go through the King. The line of iron spiders filed up the mighty hill into the Southern Hive's domain, stamping in unison as Twitch waved them forwards. I don't know what I've been told. Beep, beep, beep. But fleshy brain's got too much mold. Beep, beep, beep. Sand off. Beep, beep. Sand off. Beep, beep. Take it, Agnew. Good, beep, good, beep, good, beep, good, beep. 
The machines were physically unable to become tired of doing this, so it carried on for a long, long time. Eventually, the column came upon a hive blocking the mountaintop pass that snaked through into the hidden realm of the other ones. Darkness had fallen, but it was still clear to see that scores of other ones were nefariously strolling about campfires, deviously chatting and picking at dried plant stalks in some sort of monstrous fashion. A hive of scum and villainy to be sure, but Gustafsson seemed hesitant to go further. The Queen is not here. The drones are of no interest. We must not ripple the fog, he said. What this meant in practice was that the spiders had to climb along the steep valley slopes to reach the other end in secret. Jamming their legs into the dirt with each step, they whirred up and away, invisible in the dead of night. But they didn't make it very far, thanks to those eternal liabilities, the biologicals. You know, Big Bug, since we went to all the effort of getting these here death machines to do our bidding, why don't we just go on through and dispense the relevant services to those uppity hurl hoarders? Neil asked Gustafsson. We are not here to kill them, was the reply. Now that's wacky. Had me fooled. I got the straight up opposite impression. You're good at this, huh? Their hive is corrupt, not they, Gustafsson shouted. Despite the compliment paid, the other ones down in the valley came to investigate the noise with weapons drawn, and the jig was up. Machines and their slaves, an other one called. I prefer the term harem, really, Twitch remarked, his two-handed sword flashing in the approaching torchlight. But don't tell Catty, she's mad at me as it is. I think the general has it worse, squire, Neil said. Aye, but you know, the general was in a lot deeper with the Dioscuri sisters, if you know what I mean. Hey, forget it. Drop the gossip, all right? Rick's voice echoed through their processes. Sorry, General. Guess I forgot, you know. Oh, you think you're funny, huh? All right, calm down. Where's your sense of humor? Spent a thousand years sitting at a table with Fog and Sad Neil. That compiles your code in all kinds of directions, but not to brevity, levity, or revelry. Still got that rhyme recursion, though, Neil commented. In the world outside of the skeleton CPUs, the spiders were beating back raids from the other ones, and the non-other ones were getting stuck in too. Or too stuck in. By morning they had battled their way past the hive, but many of the only ones had been injured by their more martially gifted cousins. Beep! We must ride! Beep! Beep declared. Spider Rider! The other hivers immediately called out, and it was so. The bots dragged their mortal masters onwards. They had made it through the great teeth, and were entering the wide flat tongue that was the southern hive's domain, known as the Royal Valley. In the center of this grey veil was a large metal dome from the early Second Empire, surrounded by purplish teardrops of mank. This was the other one, seat of the corrupt queen. However, the whole valley was well aware that they had unwelcome visitors, and the invading column was skirmished with all morning. I will protect you, my queen, Gustafsson shouted amidst one of the attacks. Jumping down from his machine mount, spraining his leg on the uneven ground below, and keeling over at once. Oh, I wish you hadn't protected me, beep, beep said, pointing her unloaded, undrawn bow at the other ones, and shaking it about as if it was recoiling. For some reason, with Gustafsson rolling about on the floor below, the Queen's attacks lost their devastating effect. The Iron Spiders didn't have this problem, and the advance continued all the same. By afternoon, they were close enough to the Great Southern Hive to see its drones wandering about, and its elite Hiveguard soldiers loitering inside the central dome. Long pipes and bundles of wires were running down from the roof towards a pile of mank in the middle of all this. Surely it was the evil throne itself. Strangely though, with the attackers clearly in view, the hive's defenders seemed unperturbed. The string of spiders outside was ignored, giving them time to offload their decreasingly alive biological cargo. Gustafsson was immobile and was propped up behind a big rock nearby. This is a sour feeling, he said, shaking his head. Do not worry, nice prince, beep, beep said. We can give the beep from here, beep! 
we will kill the bad queen with our thoughts. Ha, huh. remember when we tried to make it so all the hivers could do that, Neil said. That's on the forget list, pal. We're getting away with it so far, Twitch muttered to him. The hivers settled in to chill at their rock and ordered their loyal bots to go and make an assault upon the queen's lair. Obeying, they stamped off in two neat lines, walking virtually, that is to say literally, up to the entrance to the dome, with not a single eyelash batted. Although, eyelashes were in short supply, so who's to say if that's remarkable or not? The ambivalence of the southern hivers was remarkable though, but when the reason became clear, a very certain remark came to mind. Oh shit! Twitch remarked. Yep, that's the one. A creaking goliath lumbered down from the dome, walking not so much on its steely legs, but more on its hulking ten-meter arms. It was made in the image of what gorillas had looked like many thousands of years ago, but without the weakness of soft flesh. It thumped over to the ranks of iron spiders and skeleton minders. Those arms are made from goop whoopers in the old Hydro Factorium, don't you think? Neil said. Aye, aye, you're right. Scratch me name in a few of them. You see it? Twitch said. Zooming in, looks like it says two slices short of a sandwich on the side there. I knew it! Drop the wo slices short of a sand for brevity, and I'm your skeleton man. Real smart. It's like the phrase all killer, no filler, but the opposite. Reminds me of this conversation. By the way, the enormous robot gorilla thing was taking very poorly to the iron spiders. <laughs> it chanted as it battered the bots away with its powerful goop whoopers. Spiders were sent reeling through the air, but their great number was hard to overcome. They clambered on the king's body and jabbed its wiry mechanics before being flung away and starting again. The sight was a metallic mess, as jarring as the battle between the chants of King and Beep emitted by each side respectively. The audiovisual jumble intensified when a team of Hiver soldiers came out to assist their king, revealing that very intention with loud shouts. They must have sensed the great machine failing, as it seemed to be slowing with each blow from the guild spiders. Yet those spiders were depleted also with most now missing parts just as vital to them as the goop whoopers were to the king. The inclusion of spear-wielding hivers sealed the deal, and quickly the legion was finished off. Then the defenders turned on the skeletons. They didn't say we'd lose, fucking hell, Twitch complained, proceeding to deepen the loss as a bash shook his porch so much he shut down. The other two were lights out swiftly, and that was that. A big pile of broken machines was left on the field, while the southern hivers led the jittering king away. How could the Manxand hivers preside over such a crushing defeat? Well, they hadn't noticed at all actually, as their hiding place had been stumbled upon by a local patrol. The servants of a would-be queen fended off those of a queen currently being, and then Beep and Gustafsson took a peek over at the iron pile. Oh no, they all died! Beep! Beep gasped. Fools! The opposite path would have benefited us all greatly, Gustafsson complained. The hivers went in for a closer look as darkness fell. A few of the spiders were still whirring away and managed to right themselves at Beep's command. Do not be dead! Beep! was the command specifically, and those bots of truly loyal hearts dragged themselves away to a hiding spot nearby. Despite the proximity of the other one dome, and the volume of Beep's demanding shrieks, no attention was given by the recent victors. Therefore, the rest of the Broken Circuit Brigade could be gradually dragged to the hiding spot as well. Truly the order of Queen Beep cannot be defied, for all reverted to being alive soon enough. It's hard to actually kill a machine intelligence, you see, for much of their physical body is just for sport and is very much replaceable. Once the mechanical mechanics of Agnu, Neil and Twitch were rebooted, they saw to all the rammed ram and chipped chips. The flashes of their soldering irons lit up the pitch dark night. Welcome to Flesh Flayer 4900, one of the spiders recited as its power returned. Warning, it looks like this unit was shut down unexpectedly, starting in safe mode. 
If you didn't expect to be beaten up by a giant robot yeti, you clearly weren't seeing what I was seeing in the minutes preceding shutdown, Buster. Neil scolded it. Now, you take this safe mode malarkey and shove it where the functions don't function. If you got a danger mode or something, that'd be real great. But I was built for love, the spider moaned. Aye, and I was built to take all the peas out of some rich fugs alphabeti spaghettis. But here we all are, Twitch said. This is not a time of peas. It is a time of war. All must serve, Gustafsson told them. The dawn will be the final light the false queen drinks. Prepare the soldiers for a charge. Thus charged with charging for a charge, the Iron Spiders ran their diagnostics and did the Iron Spider equivalent of licking their wounds. Due to the darkness, what this actually looks like is unknown. Beep! I have an idea! It involves rubbing! Beep! Beep suddenly announced. War is hell, alright, Neil said. The Hivers were all ears, though. If we spread our feelings onto the soldiers, they will not seem like machines. Beep! That way, they can approach like other ones. Beep! Superb idea, my queen, Gustafsson called out. At once, the Hivers began spreading their feeling onto the Iron Spiders. Due to the darkness, what this actually looks like is unknown. Thanks, Stobe, for the darkness. But whatever they did, it seemed to work. By around two in the morning, the spiders were all roughly held together by the skeleton's repairs, and the hivers had done stuff, all together allowing the spider column to walk right up to the roughly cut archway leading into the big dome. The hiver soldiers wandering about just clambered around the machines like they were furniture, with perhaps the odd utterance of, your shape is unusual, and the like. Hiver magic prevails again. But there seemed to be some limit to the spell, for after the spiders entered the dome, the mood changed. Inside, the pillars supporting the roof had been wreathed in reddish hivermank, glistening with moisture in the light of several fires. In the centre of the room was a throne, flanked by tall armoured guards. Sat upon it was a pinkish lump, plated around the stomach with rusting metal. Of course, it was a certain pretender monarch. Ting tang, walla walla, ping bang! She screamed with a mechanical whine. This, one supposes, was the signal. The advance of the spiders was halted by hiver warriors leaping down from walkways that spiralled around beneath the upper reaches of the dome. At once the entire spider cadre was beset with spears, drills and ropes. But in turn, they lashed out with weighted arms and stamped with spiked feet. Are we winning this time? Twitch asked. He was peeking around the dome entrance, the guards outside having already been drawn in. Well, given the large goop whooping hands currently wrapped around my waist, I do wonder what fate awaits me, Neil said. As he said it, he was lifted into the air by a certain giant robot gorilla, which also grabbed Twitch and Agnew in one fell swoop. You see, boys, this is when you should expect a shutdown, alright? Kinda obvious. Neil lectured the spiders. The king threw the skeletons into the middle of the dome, smashing them against the hulls of the spiders with speed enough to shatter even metal. Yes, it was definitely time to expect shutdown. The fighting petered out, with both sides having taken a fair beating, but of the mechs, only king still prowled the arena. Another defeat? Perhaps not, for as the hivers picked around the new pile of scrap they had won, the truth of the preceding sentence was unveiled. King was the only mech left alive, but remember, the Queen was a mech too. There is more fog! Beep! There is more fog! Beep beeped back behind the hiding rock. She beeped it out with such enthusiasm that some more of the other one's soldiers rumbled them, and another fight broke out. Yet her jubilation was not misguided. In front of the throne, the other one queen lay still, the arm of an iron spider wedged in her round, mechanical stomach. Beside her, two hiver guards stood sentinel, appearing unconcerned. Did they believe their queen beyond harm? The insight of the king was greater. The robot Hulk stomped over and took in the scene. No more king, it stated, turning away and walking to the back entrance of the dome. King, where are you going? 
Another one asked. Free, 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 he said, passing from the hive and out into the dawn-drenched valley, never to be seen again. These events were recounted to Gustafsson and crew by a couple of the iron spiders who used the resulting confusion to boot up and sneak away. But the bad news was the rest of them were leaking oil, venting gas, and other things one imagines are bad news for a machine. We have won! Beep! We can go and sleep now! Beep! Beep announced, but Gustafsson shook his head. The machine life forms are in service of the human prince also. It would be frozen of us to ignore this, he said. But we cannot pick them up! Beep! Then we require strength. It is time to master the art of... The ball! So saying, Gustafsson produced an AI core from his rucksack. The, the ball. ball! The other hivers cored. The ball was passed around the group, and everyone had a go at twiddling the little knobs and levers on it, as well as plugging their fingers, feet, and other protrusions into the various sockets. For some reason, it remained quite inert. Then Beep laid her grubby mitts on it and held it up against her face. Beep! she said, surely to the surprise of all. A few lights blinked on. Beep! she said again, bucking all known trends. Beep! Is that you? Izumi's voice said back. Beep! 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 the hivers echoed. Eventually, proper telephone manner was established, and the Pyrrhic victory was explained. Far away, Azaya geared up with the Thousand Guardians, packing enough choco bread to fuel a mighty rescue. Although lacking the simple raincoats required to make it not a skin-scorching affair on that drizzly day. Let's do this then, Rick said, twirling his stick and joining the crew. Sending in a general to do a squire's work. What's this knightly order come to, anyway? More like sending a prince to do a queen's work, Nuke said. He trudged out into the mud. Just get them back here. Try not to show off or anything, Izumi called from the shelter. Oh, come on. We're gonna be showing off till the show's over, Rick proclaimed. He and Nuke struck a power pose, and we know precisely what it looked like due to the light of day, so check your local manga store for the full rundown as soon as you can. The big show rolled out, following the deep spider-bot tracks up the mountainside and running slap-bang into that border hive. Survivors lingered and tried to harry the rescue party, but were not successful. The battle cry of, the faster we kill, the faster we can stop simultaneously feeling wet and on fire, was a powerful one. Their multi-elemental charge swept into the battle between originals and others down by the hive. Gustafsson and crew were saved from being compost for the hashish by this timely arrival, but the situation remained reminiscent of a hiver's favorite hashish growing medium. What the fuck is going on? Nuke asked. The machines died! Beep! Beep reported. But so did the bad queen! There will be fog! Beep! But the machines will quiet before then! Beep! We will watch you save them as a sign of our gratitude! Beep! We will not laugh! Right, get ready guys. I'm gonna hit the nest and grab some honey, Nuke said, launching into a sprint right for the dome. Get Twitch first! He's sweeter than honey, and he knows how that old shit actually works, Rick called. Nuke complied, zipping into the dome, tumbling through the pile of robots, and coming upon Twitch's wide, three-eyed face sticking out from under a spider. Nuke heaved him out and started hauling him right back out the door. The nearby other ones slowly realized what was going on. They may not have realized their queen was dead, but her loss was beginning to poison their minds. Still, once you realize you have to kill someone, the muscle memory kicks in and the weapon starts swinging. Nuke gave it all he could, rushing back to the rest of the team with a huge mob of hivers on his heels. I'm tired as fuck, boy, he wheezed as he and Twitch tumbled to the floor in front of the shack. The pursuing hivers barreled on in to the wall of scales and muscle. Tired of running all the way from the camp, the Sheik struggled to keep up with the furious energy of the other ones, not to mention their numbers. If it weren't for those couple of surviving spiders limping up to fight once again, the battle might have gone in the southern hive's favor. When the guild finally saw victory, it took the form of most of the guardians wounded on the ground, along with most of the original one hivers. 
Nasty, but with the action over, Nuke could crawl over to Twitch and start reconnecting various pins and wires all over. Within a few minutes, the skeleton jolted to life. Can we stop getting our asses handed to us please lads? He asked. We won, apparently, Rick said. But Neil and Agnew are in there. So were you, till the Royal Retriever flew on in. Ah, those two little shites. I'll get them, Twitch said, leaping to his feet. You see, the Hivers did this, uh, with the feeling juice. The other ones can't see me, you hear? With this coherent reasoning delivered, he ran off to the dome. Nuke was about to complain at the wasted effort of saving him, but sure enough, he returned with Agnew in hand, and with no heat on his tail. Oh, okay. What was the thing you were talking about? Nuke asked, but Twitch shook his head. Not for one so young. Right, I'll grab the other poser, then we can roll out, he said. Thing was, when he went back to the dome this time, the other ones were starting to get a little twitchy, funnily enough. He is the Foglight! Foglight! Someone shouted. Various voices agreed. Thus, when Twitch lugged Neil out of that dome, the entire population of the Hive decided to follow him. I ain't a Foglight! I ain't got the foggiest what you're blabbing about! Also, you're ugly, and your mum's a fucking easy cook oven! So's mine, to be fair, though, he said. But the Hive followed the so-called Foglight with equal speed and fascination. When they saw the guild, they were extremely upset. Shiny pieces! It's blinding! Dim the lights! A cry went up. What this meant was that the Hive descended upon the poor guild, who were feeling rather descended upon already. Fucking hell! Hive swarming! Nuke shouted, yet the aptness of this descriptor was little consolation. Like reeds before a wave, the guild were flattened. But where is the light? A Hiver asked. A good question. All began looking for something, and in the process started picking up guild members to carry around. Thus, while many were left bruised and beaten to wait out the night in the open, others were taken to be tied to stakes outside the hive and carefully inspected by the locals. Nuke was unconsciously paraded around by torchlight, while another VIP, Beep, was the centerpiece of the static exhibit. They weren't being killed, which was nice, but nor were their wounds covered or their stomachs filled. Were our heroes so close to victory to be left to rot and wither? It seemed that this rescue attempt was far from over. In the dead of night, the Southern Hive filed past their collection of captives, tied to poles on the hill beside their home dome. No light! No light! They muttered at each stop. The as yet unaddressed loss of their queen had sated their bloodlust, but a lust for life had not arisen in its place. As such, the depressed procession carried on until all had given the foreigners a good look. Then they trudged back down to take another look at the piles of broken machines littering the throne room. All but one, the very last hiver in the line wore his hat low over his face, attempting to hide his identity. He was literally the only one wearing a hat, but no one asked anything, so this brave agent believed his genius to have wrought success. He marched to the pole where Beep was bound, and stuffed a blood spider tooth into the aperture on the chain lock. It's a hat! Beep! You broke the pattern! Beep! Beep despaired. My queen, I am yours. I will save you. It would not be right if you died, Ignacio said. Oh dear, you are right! Beep! I was so happy the bad queen died, I forgot to stay alive! Beep! Let's hurry to be alive now! It seemed all were of roughly one mind on this matter, so Ignacio broke out all of those who could walk out of the little exhibition space. For those who were unconscious, they would have to await more muscle from the battlefield. The growing dawn reminded some of the guild members sprawled there that they were forgetting to stay alive too. Ah, for just five more minutes of death, but the wake-up calls were relentless. Up, ye disgusting bags of smaller, more disgusting bags! Twitch shouted out. I love the sound of racism in the morning, Rick commented. Did... We win, as I managed to say, raising his face from the ground by the merest sliver. Enemy got bored of watching us lose. Show's over. 
Reattach your feet and get on them. But where is the prince? He was neither in the prisoner collection on the hill or among the incapacitated on the battlefield. Prince Tashino? Isaiah called out. What? A distant voice replied. Are you okay? I'm being used as some kind of association toy. I'm out. Fuck this planet. Rick said, but Twitch and Sad Neil wanted to see. Perhaps others did too, but they were all mummified in bandages and splints by this point. In the hive, Nuke was slung over the shoulder of a local. A naked local, I could add, but that didn't actually have the implications the historical mangas would later give it. The pinkish other one drones were walking up to and away from him in turn, nodding at each other, humming a bit, and occasionally shuddering. Get me the fuck out of here, Nuke demanded. His hands and feet were bound with hairy vines. But when Twitch placed a hand on the toy boy, all the hivers around lunged closer and growled. Disassociating, disassociating, he said, backing off. The hivers eyed him skeptically, which, for clarity, looks precisely the same as any other manner in which they eye things, and then returned to admiring Nuke. What is your rank? Vocalize! A burly hiver demanded. Uh, I'm a prince, Nuke said, causing much joyous shrieking from all. We'll uh, think of something, Neil said, waving a hasty goodbye. As for what actually happened, the guild used the large-scale distraction Nuke was providing to move their machines out of the dome. More than half of the Iron Spiders were already dead as in, the power to their memory chips had been out too long so they couldn't be switched back on. The rest were stamping around again in no time, if one considers about nine hours to be no time, and when you're being voraciously associated with from all sides, the time just shoots by. When a spider brigade had been assembled, Beep sent them in for a rescue mission. Stolen association, Beep! Criminal, criminal! The only feeling should be fealty, Beep! Put out his light, so I can shine! Beep! Well, it was certainly lights out for the hivers in the nuke queue when the spiders clattered in with arms swinging. Joke's on you! I was thinking about manga the whole time! Didn't feel a thing! Nuke jeered, making his quick escape. The hive was incensed, raging against the many machines, but the gradual descent of the cloud in their minds had sapped their energy. With only minimal beatings doled out, the spiders extracted their target. Nuke was returned to the pile of guild. Well, that was weird, he said in review. Do not worry. Our association is not subject to competition, Gustafsson said. He said it from the ground, where he was lying prone at Nuke's feet. This was actually a lot less weird than you might imagine, for in the previous night's action, he had lost a leg. Suddenly noticing this, Beep bounded over. Here, nice prince, leg, beep, she said, pulling her own leg off without hesitation. Her robot leg, that is. Oh no, beep, I was standing on it, she added, tumbling to the ground. Gustafsson happened to roll over at that very moment, resulting in a situation theorized to be possible throughout the Mangaka Academy of Modern Science. The leg, it is for me, Gustafsson said, almost directly into Beep's mouth. Beep, I want the hero to walk, beep. And I want to ride you! Excellent! Place it on the end of my remaining stump and engage the clamps! Beep! It is already there! Can you feel it? Beep! Yes! I can feel the entire length! Nuke slumped down on the floor, pulling his AI core up to his face. You see, it's happening again, he complained. What's wrong, Nuke? What's going on? Izumi's entangled voice replied. Association. So much. Are you okay? They violated me. Really? Don't sound so excited. Sorry, I didn't mean... Just come back quickly, okay? We are coming, whether you ask us to or not, Gustafsson announced. Oh, I see what you mean. I'm sorry, Nuke. Did you at least rescue them all? Yeah, we're come returning back soon, once everyone gets up, is back on their feet. Oh, but feet could be a thing. Please... Let's just research a cure when we're home. I don't think the parasite will allow it. Stay safe, Izumi chirped. Nuke, unable to decide if he preferred what he saw with his eyes open or closed, almost literally buried his head in the sand and napped until about three that night. 
By then, the entire away team had been reassembled, in several senses of the word, and it was time to return in triumph. The surviving Iron Spiders helped transport the limping biologicals back out of the great royal mouth, passing the docile border hive, then crossing the big valley beyond to reach the camp the following afternoon. You made it, Izumi said, running out to hug Nuke. Ah, you're all wet. Acid burned away the pain receptors. Actually all right now, Nuke said. But yeah, let's go inside. I just want to associate with, like, only you for a while. My good name's been dragged through the mud. Mud's a great conductor, Izumi nodded with a wide-eyed grin. Nuke cast a glance to Rick, who shrugged. Poor prince is getting to where they ended up in the First Empire, he said to his skeleton crew. As they say, we might have conquered the Earth clans, but the Earth Chans conquered us, Neil quipped. The camp shelter's original purpose of being a skin regrowing center was now to be put to use. But the place was also currently doubling as a prison for the two other one princes previously captured. Gustafsson was eager to give them the news. The leash has been severed. Now you must grasp threads anew to survive. What say you? He said to the war prince. You have no sense. The world will end now, the prince said. False. The world already ended. This is the rebuilding. There will be only one hive, and not even another one. We cannot live while the machines still rule. They do not rule. They are stupid. Look, machine! Gustafsson gestured for Twitch to approach. I have a name, you know, Twitch said. False! Inform the other one that you do not rule. You mean the Second Empire? Yeah, that's gone, nearly. Everyone's doing their own thing now. You'd best get in on this hyper degeneracy before the boat sails. There is degeneracy? The prince asked, suddenly sitting up in his cage. Oh yes, the magic word. It is the grim darkness of the far future, and there is only degeneracy, Gustafsson announced. With this, the war prince seemed intrigued to learn of just what was happening outside of the southern hive. He listened intently to different versions of the tale told by different guild members, and then read the infallible manga version that proved them all wrong. Indeed, from the angles it was portrayed, history was rather spicy. The prince then expressed his willingness to associate with the Manx and Hive, and everyone watched. My name is Vio, he said. Oh, Beep, a very beautiful name, Beep said. No, mine is more beautiful, Gustafsson insisted. But I don't know what your name is, Beep. I will let you feel it. So saying, Gustafsson touched Beep on the shoulder. Beep, Beep, amazing. You feel very special to me. I will serve you additional feeling at your will, Gustafsson said with a bow. This was probably the most romantic thing you'll ever see from Hivers, and the Mangaka girls wasted no time in getting it into the history comics. Maybe they spared a panel for the historic conversion of the leading Southern Hiver prince to the Manxand Hive, but it just wasn't as cute. Once all was inked and done, the guild's business in the land of the other ones was over. They caught up on sleep and skin thickness and prepared to leave. The expedition as a whole wasn't over, for the only reason they had rolled out to begin with was to get a chance to visit Enrico for the next shipment of reverse-engineered tech. Once ready, the guild set off northwest to find a route back to Morn, but the spiders weren't to follow. At this point, their legs were held together with dried fishman paste, so their top speed was a little low. Therefore, they were sent to walk back to Manxand on their own. That route was to the northeast, through Stobes Gamble, home of the Land Bats. And the Land Bats really, really liked fishman paste. But we'll get back to that. Before anything interesting happened to the Spider Column, the guild had hauled themselves all the way up to Morn and then on to the Tech Scribe Enclave on the hills above Flats Lagoon. My favorite flesh mesh, Enrico called as Azumi entered the bar slash world's most foremost analytics bureau. We've got something for you. I managed to remember how uranium works. The rest of the bar patrons slash renowned scientists seemed to glare at their robot overlord in an actually it was us who did all the work sort of way. It's a very recognizable sort of way. Great, how does it make the steam then? 
Izumi asked. Oh, it's very, very complicated, but entirely safe. Entirely safe! And don't you worry about information to the contrary. Only thing you need to concern your pretty little... Oh, it hurts to lie. Look, you gremlin! Just compact the uranium so it can undergo a chain reaction. It's all here in the books, and the missing pages are not about safety, so really just follow your heart, okay? Ah, it's pain! Enrico retired from the table, leaving behind a collection of books and cases of electronics for Azumi to ferry home. I think he's lying, Nuke said through a mouthful of rum-soaked choco bread. Hammer did say there was something really dangerous about playing with substances with an unstable nucleus, Izumi said. Well, it's safe to smoke, we know that much, Nuke said, his brain surely completely moss-free. Can't argue with that. Let's just get back then. I'll go to the lab and sit with all this in the dark like the gremlin I am. Yeah, but a pretty little gremlin, Nuke offered. Suffice to say, this act of romance didn't make the history comics in the end. While at the Enclave, they got beep sorted out with a new robot leg, much more expensive and flashy than the last one. She probably said something like, I can be erect, when it was attached, but for the sake of brevity, from now on, we'll just presume the Hivers are always saying something to that effect at all times, and not specifically mention it here. After staying the night in the Enclave, the last leg home was afoot. But far away, a poor iron spider was sending out a distress signal. One of the battle bots had had its paste legs chewed to oblivion and was stuck on the edge of Stobe's gamble. The signal washed its way over the enclave. Oh, don't guilt me like this, Twitch said. You hearing that too, huh? Seems like our little children want attention, Neil said. Gah, Agnew said. Yeah, I hear it, Rick told them. Seems like you went through some shit. You wanna go? I can't help it, General, Twitch moaned. We rebuilt those things like four times during Operation Icky Sticky. They're as good as our own. I know what it feels like to be a daddy. Go on, we'll catch you on the flip side or whatever. And that is why the three non-new man skeletons rushed off to home in on the SOS beacon. Everyone else just sat around, waiting for the Venge laser to shut down before heading out. So might as well follow this non-humanitarian humanitarian sortie. These doctors without borders, or brains, were cruelly attacked by Beak Things on the way, in violation of the Beak Things' own convention of inedible materials rights. Those fucking scientists in the day, making their weird species all over the shop, Twitch complained. What was this even meant to be? Did the planet need an apex predator that eats us? We had the parasite already. Uh, well, did you ever see that Pokemon stuff? Neil said. Nah, never went in for animal cruelty, Twitch replied, his six-foot Japanese sword plunging down to the hilt into a beak thing chest. Never mind then. Oh shit, they're eating Agnew. Twitch and Neil worked to cut Agnew out of one of the beak thing's mouths, dispatched the rest, wired Agnew's head back in, and they were good to go. They ran east and found the collection of iron spiders waiting around at the edge of the southeastern Venge desert. Not far south was their trapped comrade, lying beside a few perished land bats in the old war-scorched earth. Agnew went over to bring the patient back, but as he returned, there was a writhing flourish of colour behind him. Oh shit! Looper lads coming in hot! Twitch shouted. Following Agnew was a whole pack of land bats. Or is it a flock? A colony? A fuckload of Pokemon! Neil clarified. The bats, with fur of white, red and blue, hungrily dashed for the metal meal assembled before them. Their teeth latched onto the pasty patchwork all over the spider legs, and the skeletons frantically sliced and diced in all directions. Oh, the land battery! Neil shouted as he was knocked down by the swarming foes. Hey boys, who wants to play some more wacky bat slamming? Gah, Agnew said. Uh, it's a bit funny, come on, Twitch said. The skeletons and spiders did their best, and just about scraped through the ordeal. All the spiders were wrecked, so now they were all stuck there pulling paste back out of the land bat's stomachs to make their repairs. Indeed, 
disgusting bags filled with smaller, more disgusting bags. Let's not focus on the details, but it all worked somehow. At nightfall, the robotic ramble carried on north towards Brink. The rest of the guild had the same destination, making a cheeky run below the sleeping eye. Both groups met at dawn on the slopes beneath the town gates. You saved them, bravo! Isaiah cheered. Aye, was a close one, right? Agnew got a good look at the inside of a big thing, eh? Twitch said. Grrr, Agnew said. That's not what I saw, Els said. Once all were done staring at him, and he was done not giving any further elaboration, it was time to carry on to Manxand. I must say, these robot warriors shoulder our debts heavily, Isaiah said. Would we be here today without them? That we are able to bring them back to share in our victory is the best thing about this whole campaign. Sure, Nuke said. And Bad Green and Waifu must be happy to keep their little soldiers, right? Since we won, it's fine for them to be dead. Beep, Beep said. Now that's old-fashioned samurai leadership, Sandor said. Whatever the case, the spiders were carried along by the Thousand Guardians and joined in the joyous return down into the mighty Mankey Canyon. The usual pile of corpses by the gate was deftly stepped over, and the canyon crew cheered for the glorious return of their drug barons. The spiders got to meet the experimental reprogrammed spiders already tending the crops, catching a glimpse of the quiet life a retired biological slayer could enjoy outside the clutches of the Second Empire. Although in fact, they would be put to work on something a little closer to their previous vocation. You see, Izumi wasted no time in setting herself up in the lab to begin reviewing the tech scribe data on uranium. As usual, she wanted to be left completely alone at her desk, so the rest of the tech hunters were to help by collecting more samples. Thus, the spiders were deployed out of the canyon and up to the great big warming rock on the peak between Manxand and Black Scratch. They stood guard while the tech hunters chipped green chunks into bags. These chunks, according to the research, could be compacted into pellets of intense energy density, which were, one presumes, as safe to handle as the raw materials were to smoke. Extremely safe, then. The local pirates and reavers were absolutely outraged that the beloved warming rock was being defaced, but to what local authority could they submit their heavily signatured petition to protest? Luckily, they thought of another way to express their grievances, but unluckily, when they charged the crew with swords drawn, a load of robot spiders popped out from crevices and filibustered the motion with truly mechanical efficiency. Thus, heavy bags of nuclear fuel were delivered to the canyon, and Azumi worked day and night to determine how to achieve proper compression. At least, it seemed like she was working day and night. Only Nuke was ever allowed in there to see what was going on in the lab of many flashing lights, but when asked for details, he could only reply that people simply wouldn't understand. Damn those elitist academics! Best leave them all to it, and otherwise just soak in the recent victory. In fact, why not make an event of it? Rumours stirred of a worldwide TCM Plus to the Power of Plus Guild official victory tour. A noxious yellow gas spurted from the exhaust of the whirring machine. In the shadow of Tashino Towers, Izumi's do-it-yourself uranium enrichment kit let out a loud metallic ping. Cake's ready, she called, and Nuke came wandering over. It was almost a classical domestic scene, until Izumi opened a drawer on the twisted machine, twice her height, and popped out a steaming cylinder of cake. Yellow cake. Cake that really gets your neutrons flowing, if you know what I mean, and if you were anyone there but Izumi, you probably didn't. Nice, probably, Nuke nodded. It looked too big to smoke, but he wanted to put on a happy face anyway. This will be the fuel for the reactor, Izumi explained. And how will it react? It's gonna get real hot. I got books for that. Not hot enough, did Generate. Ah yes, some relativistic degenerate matter would do much better. Hmm, yes. Degeneracy is only a relative matter, really. I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing. As good an excuse as any to stop. You coming upstairs? Let me try this a bit more. These fuel pellets are going to be essential. Although making the reactors the hard part. 
<laughs> you said. And I meant it. Go on. Izumi and the tech hunters kept that machine running late into the night, refining the warming rock chunks into warmer, very poisonous cylinders that'd burn the brain moss right off you at 50 paces. Nuke went to lounge about in the main hall, but a disturbance in the fog was afoot. Down the valley, within the shimmering walls of the Manx Sand Hive, Beep sat between two fires deep in meditation. Gustafsson stood silently behind her, and in the grounds outside, the Iron Spider soldiers kept close watch over the entry holes. This peaceful scene was interrupted only by a passing parade of shouts when Krusty the Crab got a hold of a fuel rod and scurried around while trying to eat it. Oh, but as you can imagine, that was hardly an interruption at all. Suddenly, Beep pointed straight forwards and stood up. It is clear. Beep! The path is ready. I have to beep over there. Beep! She announced. Knowing at once what to do, Gustafsson sprinted for Tashino Towers. Whirling up the ramp, he bounded into the hall, finding most of the guild lying about listening to Nuke rant. If you read The Rusty Agronian Spade, you would be all like, that's so lewd, tasteless. But then if you went and read Mr. Sister's Wild Wake, then Rusty Spade seems harmless in comparison. So what is degeneracy? It's all relative. This is what I call the theory of relativity, he explained. I hope someone was getting all this down. Gustafsson, though, couldn't care less. I have come, and so has the time, he hailed. It's always time for bad green. What's keeping you up at this late hour? Oh, for fuck's sake, Nuke said. The transition is upon us. The new queen awakens. And you want us to watch? I want you to run. We must reach the fallen so the risen may inherit the legacy. Wait, the legacy, Elena said. Could this be a reference to the stored knowledge of the past kept within the Hiver Queen? It is more than knowledge, Gustafsson said, but otherwise he appeared to be agreeing. Trip to see the queen? Why not? Nuke shrugged. The old queen! Gustafsson shot back. What? I'm only a princess, Azumi muttered as she entered, crab slobber really making her greasy hair shine. Classic stuff, but the tall and short of it was that Beep needed to get to the other side of the world. But if there's to be a royal venture, why not add some extra palaces on the way? The animals were stacked with soft brown and glowing green, and the guild was rallied for a little tour of the provinces. In an age where quantum-entangled communication was in its infancy, visiting one's own territory was the best way for a monarch to enforce the law. Since the actual emperor hadn't left his burrow in a good while, certain proclamations had gone unheard. Such was clear when the guild hiked through the hills towards Heft and came upon a slave camp. And not just any slave camp. This was the very spot where Nuke, Green Emperor Tashino, had been locked up. It was a bad day to be a slaver. Hello, all, Nuke called out at the gate. It's your boy, Nuke, back at it again with another prison break. This, like all good quality prison breaks, is brought to you by the Tashino Economic Union of Substance Abusers, turning forced labor into labor force. And we hit it old school. While I'm not entirely sure what that means, my legal advisors inform me that it is indeed the case. Now, pertaining to the current engagement, I happen to know that some of these prison guards aren't entirely useless dregs. Therefore, I will offer amnesty to any guard who can produce me a convincing drawing of famous pop culture icon, Rock Chan. You will be rewarded with a license to remain alive, so long as you keep drawing B-frames in my new magic moving manga project. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks, and down with the oppressors. But not me, because the Green Emperor oppresses you just right. Meanwhile, the rest of the guild was busy downing guards, breaking chains, and assessing Rock Chan art contest submissions, all drawn like their life depended on it. But clearly, some just didn't value their lives highly enough. Night fell while all this was going on, and in search of a place to stay, Nuke knocked on the door of the fanciest building in the camp. It was a big Second Empire-style house, 
the sort of thing the nobles of the empire had built for themselves, even in squalorous mining pits. Fuck off! A voice came from inside. That'd be the noble. Ma'am, you're in real trouble in there. This whole thing's real illegal. I think, Nuke said, shaking his head and getting to work on the door lock. However, this cunning noble had accounted for such things. The door was lined with an array of locks of different sizes, shapes and historical value. That door wasn't opening any time soon. But the Green Emperor wasn't going away any time soon either. Nuke fiddled, fudged, riddled and budged, and eventually there was a hiss of rapidly flowing water and a hydraulic lever pulled the bulkhead door into a recess in the ground. Wakey wakey, it's time to get nuked, Nuke announced, but inside there were several samurai bodyguards. You'd stand against your own prince? Nuke asked. For money, yeah, one of them shrugged. Understandable, have a great day, Nuke said, turning around and walking back out. The bodyguards looked at each other in confusion, but then the whole building rattled and shook as the thousand guardians piled in from outside, figurative guns figuratively blazing. The guards were overrun, while Nuke, Els, Washington and Sandor swept all the valuables they could find into bags. Like true heroes, they stole from the rich to give to the probably technically a bit richer, but drug running had the ethical high ground over slavery. So, bad luck to Lady Reuben of Heng, who was now placed in chains herself and led out of the camp to a chorus of jeers. The guild were taking her to Heft, where a grim sentence in the Imperial prison awaited. Yes, they say that no one escaped the law, although if the guild were the ones saying that, they must have forgotten how several of them had done just that. In fact, escaping seemed to be relatively easy, even for the most highly guarded inmates. This was evidenced by a chance encounter on the road to the capital. Lying in the sand was a near-naked man, his pale skin stained red by the heat, his legs bound by shackles. In the United Cities Empire, that's really just a standard roadside feature. But foolish Wadston felt an old tingle in his heart and decided to investigate. Are you alive? He asked the body. The body turned over. Not the Warren! I cannot bear one more moment in that Warren! The moss! The moss! Squaw! The man said. It was none other than the Holy Phoenix. Sorry, bird brain, I'm cleaning up the streets, and you were a present for Dad, so don't be rude, Nuke said. The Phoenix joined Reuben as a very important prisoner, and was dragged through the capital gates soon enough. The guild took their captives to the skimmer shed, diving for cover as the door was opened, and then, once the wind had done its thing, venturing inside. Skim friends, Els called out. The skimmers replied with a bone-shuddering purr. What the fuck is this shit? Take me to the Emperor, I'll have you executed, Reuben shouted, but Nuke held her still. You're making a bad impression to your new roommates, my lady, he said. Then there was a scuffle outside. Lady Reuben, what's happening? A voice called. A man in armor stood at the head of a group of club-carrying merchants. Fucking hash boys gone rogue! Get me out of here! Reuben called. Those guys tried, but starting a fight with the guild's veteran warriors was a bad idea on the best of days. Doing it while they were standing in front of a room full of twitchy skimmers was really overkill. In their failure, Lady Reuben was doomed to be locked up in the middle of the stable, surrounded on all sides by skimmer pens. Now that's a prison. Why escape when it's better to keep the bars of your cage between you and those long teeth? Now the other prisoner needed to be dealt with. Nuke took the Holy Phoenix to see the Emperor, by which of course I mean Nuke walked in front of Wadston, who carried the Phoenix on his back. This, for the Phoenix, was a real treat almost titillation enough to make him forget the den of sin he was being thrown back into. The throne room was like an alien planet these days. Its floors and walls were lined with mule cuboids, and the throne itself was lost in a labyrinth of gaseous green tunnels, all barely wide enough for one to worm their way about inside. When all this had started, no one had asked any questions, but if they had, maybe things wouldn't have gotten this far. 
Oh, see trees are green. Green roses too. A voice came from inside the mega structure. I see them pal. Can't get enough. And I say to myself, what the fuck is shit going on? Where is Righty? Dad, I got him out here. Nuke called into one of the tunnel entrances. Oh, is that guy? The guy who's half me and half my age. Go on then, pass him in. I'll get him settled again. You mean just into the wormhole? Yeah, they'll know what to do. The phoenix was struggling against his binds and coring uncontrollably, but Watson managed to maneuver him towards the tunnel. Once he was at the threshold, two pairs of green hairy arms emerged from the darkness within. Grabbing the phoenix calmly, they began dragging their quarry into the depths, unmoved by the fallen leader's screams. Then, from another tunnel, Emperor Tengu shuffled into view. So, been getting the green shipments then, Nuke said. Tengu emerged as far as his torso, probably for the best as he appeared to be unclothed, and replied. Yeah, you did it boy! That stupid bridge, that stupid mank, it was all for real! You've saved the Empire! Is the whole Empire gonna be like this, then? Oh, don't tempt me! Don't fuel my dreams, my boy! Nah, we gotta keep it all out of the light, don't we? Moss needs dark, don't it? Well, sure. Actually, that reminds me, Izzy had something to show you. We've come up with a demonstration for what all the old tech we've been rustling up can do. But you need to go to the other end of town for it, and be wearing clothes. Sorry, I don't make the rules. Whoever made those fucking rules is a fucking regenerate! But alright, I'm game for a laugh, Tengu said, slithering back into the lair, then climbing out of a sort of hatch further back, crawling across the top and thudding down onto the last remaining bit of floor by the stairs. Been well, my son? he asked. Not as good as you, come on. Nuke took Tengu down to the stables. When Lady Reuben saw her liege, she cried out. My lord, please save me, forgive me! Oh, all right there, Ruby. Ruby, 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 Ruby here! Whoa! Tengu sang, following Nuke upstairs. The second floor of the stable building had an open hall, in which most of the guild was assembled. On the floor was a wide basin, with rows of pipes and electric lights overhanging it. Zumi was shoveling mank from a wet sack into the middle of the thing while the tech hunters spread it about with their hands. Either something delightfully degenerate was about to happen, or this was an ancient industrial farming experiment. Blast twas the latter, as Azumi quickly revealed. This is hydroponics, she proudly claimed. Hydropon what? Tengu asked. Did you ever wonder how the First Empire fed all those people on a planet as barren as this? Izumi asked with rehearsed flair. First what? Tengu jeered. Yes, it was surely by some marvel of the ancients, and this is it. Hydroponics is a revolutionary mank-based farming solution that allows crops of all kinds to be produced in a controlled indoor environment. It allows basic fertilizing medium, such as that supplied by the kind creatures downstairs, to be kept moist and nutritious, even here in the middle of the desert. Always wanted to do that. Thanks. Right, let's bugger off, Tengu said. Wait, Dad, I don't think you're getting it, Nuke said. We can make food inside with a machine. No slaves, no skimmers. Actually, there are skimmers, but not like eating you. If anything, you're eating stuff that they ate. Look, look. He pointed at a certain spot in the mank, and indeed there was a little yellow sprout sticking out of it. The machine hummed, and a fine mist of water was floating down from the pipes above. These genetically souped-up wheat straw plants were growing so fast you could see it, if you looked really carefully. Not that Tengu was doing this, but still, he started to realize what this mad science stuff was actually all about. I can grow my fucking own, he realized. Yes, that is one application of this technology, but the wider agricultural implications are far... Izumi tried to say, but she stopped as Tengu was shoving strings of golden cats into her hands. I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take them all! He cried. It's not for sale. I mean, it's free. Free? 
I'm doing this to save the world from being a hellhole. But if you put my name on everything and mention that I'm the world's foremost scientist, I guess that would be fine, Izumi said. Oh, fuck whatever you want, my girl. You stand tall over all them boffins. Well, not literally, you know. In fact, fuck it, literally, you're the smartest, tallest, whateverest little brain box this side of Ocran. Oi, you know what? I should introduce you to my son. He's single, you know, and he's not as old as he looks. Dad, Dad, we already did that, Nuke said. You degenerates! I love it! Tengu cheered. Well, this all seemed to have gone swimmingly, which is extra surprising out there in the midst of the Great Desert. The locals would study Azumi's revolutionary farming device and ponder the mysteries of Mank, and surely the Empire could prosper anew just as soon as they all got done growing narcotics in their attics on the sly. With all this, you'd think the guild would have garnered a pretty good reputation. But at their next stop of the tour, the western city of Stack, they received a chilly reception. It seemed that their upending of the slave economy was ruffling certain feathers, and the owners of those feathers were then ruffling all the feathers around them in outrage, and by the time the guild arrived, everyone was ruffled inside out. Drugs for sale, Nuke sang as he entered the large general store in the middle of town. The storekeep slammed her hands on the counter, then pointed at the door. Get out of here, rebel! This town doesn't need any more dregs, she shouted. I didn't say dregs, I said drugs. And I said get out! Fucking wild child prince fucking this empire up with his stupid ideas! Taking drugs while a robot does the work is a great idea start to finish, missy. We've been doing just fine all this time without that, eh? And now samurai saying I have to pay the hands. Fuck right off, I'll go under! Nice, the guild will buy up your stock and replace you with a talking cut out of a cat girl. Everyone wins, Nuke said, taking this fine business idea with him back out into the street. What happened, my prince? Watson asked him. Not sure, my man. Seems they don't like me around here. Prince Tashino, I fear the locals might not be heeding your proclamations, Isaiah said. He was pointing down the street, where occupied slave pens were visible on a rooftop through the haze. I think some people are losing money on the whole automation thing. Losing it to me, specifically, Nuke said. Should we try to return it to them to ease the tension? Wadston suggested. <laughs> I would have if they asked nicely, but this is bullshit. No, I'm just going to kill them. Hooray! Isaiah cheered. The other Sheik admired this fine business decision also, and soon the guild was bringing another high-quality prison break to stack Central Slave Market. The ringleader was stashed in one of the cages, the stock was liberated, and Nuke had a stern word with the crowd gawking at the commotion. Look, you morons, this is easy, okay? Right now, if you have a slave, then you're paying to feed them, keep them alive, sometimes, and stuff. But if you instead give that money to them and let them buy the food and beds themselves, then you still lose the same amount, but the slave feels less shitty about everything. You see? It's just straight up better. And anyway, send someone to the capital to find out how robots taking all your jobs is the future. Don't worry, you will be provided a set of universal basic intoxicants to while away the time. That's all the First Empire did, and manga was illegal for them. So you know, this is the new golden age. Now, uh, someone get in there and clean up the blood, we're off. All hail me, your prince, don't forget. From slavery, to wage slavery, to fully automated luxury narcotic monarchy, the Empire was set for a fair few economic changes, it seemed. Leaving Stack meant the Imperial part of the victory tour was over. Next on the schedule was a visit to what remained of the Holy Nation to see how that was coming along these days, and then a bend round to the south for a coronation party in the Royal Hive. Izumi and co were eagerly awaiting the stores of ancient data this would provide, but in truth, only a dark shadow awaited them. <laughs>